Let's go at Rockfin. Happy Tuesday, guys. Welcome, welcome to Savvy Sabs Podcast. I'm your host, Sabrina Salvati. If you're new, I want to let you know that Savvy Sabs Podcast is a part of Revolutionary Blackout Network. You can catch me there on Thursdays for the Savvy and JB show. And you can catch me here on Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and every other Sunday. Shout out to everyone watching on YouTube, Rockfin, Twitter, and Rumble. And welcome back, guys. Hope you had a great weekend. I do believe my special guest is here. Matt, I'll bring you in whenever you're ready. All right. My special guest tonight is Matt Taibbi. You guys know him well. Welcome back, Matt. How's it going, Sabi? Great. How are you? I'm good. Thanks. How are you? I'm great. Did you get a chance to see the eclipse at all? I did. Yeah, it was pretty good. I'm, I'm in Jersey. Uh, it, it was almost total. How about you? It wasn't uh, as as big of a thing here. I think in Massachusetts, like it got a little a little darker here. But um, mm. I was told to go up to Maine to go see the full thing. But because huh. it was on a weekday, I just couldn't do it. Like drive right. up there. But right. yeah, we also had an earthquake here, which was which was interesting. So um, I heard. Yeah, and Did I live in a house on stilts, so it was a little it was a little intense. But uh, yeah, it was cool. So you felt the earthquake? Oh, but yeah. Yeah, the second one, the, the the aftershock was was intense. It was pretty close to my house. So, oh my gosh, yeah, I saw a tweet from Margaret Kimberly that said she was at the airport when it happened, so she was waiting to find out if she was going to be able to fly or not. So that's crazy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, maybe the maybe it's the sign of the apocalypse. You never know. So, <laughs> uh. all right, Matt. So recently uh you actually had a discussion on uh rising uh with brie i think a lot of us that were watching that we were kind of surprised um at how heated the conversation became because i mean i like the work that you do i like the work that brie does and i think a lot of us were just surprised uh by the way that this conversation actually went i want to play a small part of that here and then i do have a couple questions to ask you about this discussion. Let me go ahead and bring in this clip here. I think what would be clarifying is to have some insight into what you meant by decline to criticize you. Because that that seems to me to be where the bulk of the No, that seems to be what is. you want to talk about. But let's just be clear. I'll, I'll, I'll be done with this in, in 18 seconds, okay? Just to be clear, you made factual mistakes about 
when I when I re revealed that I was being censored, uh, you uh, made a mistake in saying that I haven't I, I still haven't criticized them. I haven't criticized them over the last year. Uh, you, you made a mistake in saying the Twitter file searches were not done. You you made a mistake in saying that there was one cache. I don't know where you got that from. It you was, said a, it was a mistake, baby. Not, I, I have no interest in denying that. But but I okay, would like well, to talk that's, about that that's a little bit though, because I'm when you came done. online, there's, there's, there's more. Okay. Uh, you, 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 Look, well, go, go ahead. Go, we, we, I mean, we had you on because we wanted to make sure we get to all of yeah, this. I, I would have, I would have been happy with a correction, but, 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 but since you're not going to do that, um, you know, okay. The other, the other two were, oh. you were saying that uh, essentially that I, that I had done searches only for one side and not the other. Well, I Matt, actually let's did, talk about I that. I didn't, you, I didn't say you had done searches for one side or the other. I said I had you on my show, and you got very bris bristly with me at that time as well. I wish we could have these conversations without them turning into these weird personal vendettas. I think we'd have a lot more productivity in this space if we did. Let's not have but any wait a minute. Vendettas, when you, but... Robbie, this is not necessary for you to intervene at this juncture. What I okay, um, <laughs> I'll, I'll go ahead and and stop it there. I'm curious, Matt. Um, what were you expecting uh, from this this conversation? Like, what were your expectations going into this discussion? Well, I'm a little bit old school, and <clears throat> I think corrections have to be corrected. Uh, there was a lot made in the in the initial podcast segment. Uh, I'm sorry, the initial segment on rising uh, between, uh, Brianna and, and Robbie about how I had waited for a full year to tell the world, uh, that I had been censored and she went on and on about that. Uh, and that just simply wasn't true. And I knew it wasn't true because she had cited the article that I wrote the day that it happened. I mean, there were six mistakes in the first segment and two more pretty serious ones in the second one. And, you know, I, I just don't know what to do say about that other than I think you have to get things right factually and then we can have a discussion about all these other things which I was just very happy to do it's just that we ran out of time because it took so long to get to uh you know rolling out all the corrections so you know I I'm old school whenever I make a mistake I cop to it that's one of the things that happened to me on the air with Mehdi Hassan like was that an error? Yes, it was an error. I'm, you know, I, I admit to it. I always put a, a notation um, in my articles. I leave it there forever to make sure that people know that I ever originally made a mistake in that spot. I think, you know, journalists have to do that, uh, whether they like it or not. It's the only way back uh, to winning trust with audiences. So that was the whole thing. And this, it, it, a little bit of it is just my the irritation ongoing with you know the sort of demonization of um my process with the twitter files which was an extraordinarily difficult ethical and logistical task as a journalist i did the best i could i wasn't trying to screw everybody over i was just trying to handle a tough situation and got the most out of it that i that you know was possible which I think was was what people want from reporters. And I, I, I've struggled to understand what the hostility is, is about there. Do you think, and I'll get to the hostility point in just a second, but were you expecting some type of retraction for the comments that were made in reference to your reporting with the Twitter files? Um, yes. Well, I mean, it was clear uh, from the, the correspondence before the show that that wasn't going to happen. Uh, so that I had to go on the show to, to try to uh, elicit it from, um, from Brianna. But even you, you saw even in the show when I brought up the fact that, you know, you said that I had favored one side and not the other, that I had done searches on the right and not on the left. And she said, no, I didn't do that. I made the mistake of not having a printout so I could say, this is what you said word for word. And this is what you said. If you were going to substantively, substantively and genuinely committed in looking at, cens at censorship programs, you were going to at least do an investigation, do a search, do a word search that is broader than just terms that are associated with attacks on the right. I was surprised that he didn't even out of uh, curiosity put Bernie on there. And, and so I was saying, I, I didn't do that. I didn't look at either side 
And I think that's an important clarification. I should be allowed to say that if they're not going to have me on, you should at least, you know, do a one minute intro and say, yeah, we got some things wrong. Sorry about that. You know, apologies to Matt, you know, that, that kind of thing. It's not the end of the world. Um, I think that's, it, it, th there's a stigma associated with it now that um, I don't really understand, so. Well, in, in reference to the hostility, I want to show you uh, this part right, right here. Uh, Nico House actually tweeted this out. This doesn't surprise me. Uh, Nico said, Twitter shadow banned me and took 10,000 followers away from me during the course of a week. Um, and it was probably more than that because I was gaining followers as Twitter took them away. Why do liberals and Zionists never seem to have this problem with Twitter? Because the rest of us seem to have this problem every other week. So I think uh, Nico's example brings up a really good point. I think some of the frustration, uh, I think coming from Bree is probably that I think when the Twitter files were released, I think some of us that are either progressive or I guess I'm a socialist. So uh, a lot of us that are progressive socialists, uh, we've been heavily suppressed on Twitter. There's a lot of shadow banning going on, which I'm, I'm sure you can see uh, as well. Meanwhile, there I mean, are- right I'm shadow banned. On Twitter. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know we talked about this. Uh, but meanwhile, there, there are right wing accounts on Twitter that are being amplified uh, by Elon Musk, certain ones, not all of them. Um, but I, I think that's probably where some of that frustration may come from um, on on Bree's side. But just so everyone can hear this again, uh, I know you've said this before, but uh, just for, to be on the record. Uh, again, the process in reference to how you searched for certain information on the Twitter files. Could you please explain that for everyone one more time? Okay, so when we started the Twitter files, the only time we had any direction about a theme was the first Twitter files when I sat down with Elon and other executives and we picked the Hunter Biden story, not because it was a partisan story, but because it was the only story that we knew of where there was a concrete example of censorship that we could look for. Uh, and the task there was to see if there were any communications to and from the government. Interestingly, we didn't find them. Uh, I mean, eventually we found some things that suggested that, but that was the end of that in terms of uh, direction. After that, we very briefly had a period where we were just able to search broadly on our own uh, the Slack uh, chats that were of Twitter executives from a pretty sizable time period in 2020. And during that time, we downloaded a lot of information. And in that couple of days, we started to see lots and lots of these communications that said flagged by DHS, flagged by uh, FBI, flagged by FITF, flagged by HHS, whatever it was. And because of the sensitivity of this material and the explosive nature of it, I immediately concluded that, number one, this project was temporary. It was not going to last very long. Whatever it was, it wasn't going to happen for a very long time. Whether that meant the government was going to pressure us or somebody was going to pressure Elon or whatever. So the goal became, let's get everything that we can, as much as we can, as fast as we can. And I focused on that issue, the, the, the government issue, because I didn't want to come, up, come away with no big story. The, the relationship of the company to these government enforcement agencies I saw as critical and just did tons and tons of searches on them the people associated with those agencies and certain Twitter executives who I thought might be involved in the moderation process. And that, and it was basically that and follow-ups of that, that comprised 90% of the Twitter file stuff. There were some extraneous things that we we caught on the way, but the bulk of it was just seeing one thing and going for it early. And that was it basically. Okay. Yeah. So, cause I remember the first time that you and I spoke after the Twitter files, you were explaining like there were certain things that you looked for, such as the DOJ, the FBI, the government agencies, et cetera. And then there was certain information that was revealed from that. I remember you did mention consortium news was another one that was, there was some type of suppression or censorship there. I do remember that. So I just wanted you to clarify that again for everybody who hasn't, who probably hasn't heard it again for this time around. 
Um, but I think that well, I, I'm sure. Oh, go so, ahead. Yeah, just just uh, one quick thing about that. People have to understand that this this stuff all happens in a finite period. It wasn't a normal like source reporter or situation. It was a high profile thing that was happening as we were getting the stuff. And we were actually under pressure to try to keep things going by cranking out content. Like, in other words, we didn't want to um, leave enough time for people to attack the process. So we kept trying to stay ahead of the news cycle by creating material. That meant that we had to basically dig, 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 create, create, create as fast as we could. And, you know, when you have to make a couple of command decisions at the beginning of those things, it didn't allow for a lot of, well, let's investigate this or that. It, it just wasn't possible time wise. Yeah, because I remember when the Twitter files were being released, like I covered, I think that very first one that you post. And the next thing I knew there was another one. <laughs> there was another one. They were being released very quickly. I do remember that. So I guess I'm curious, uh, Matt, after everything that's happened after the release of the Twitter files and including that hearing that you had in front of Congress, how do you feel about uh, Elon, who actually you know, got the ball rolling on all of this, just kind of, in my opinion, washing his hands of the matter uh, and not being there to defend you and support you when I feel like you did need that support. So for example, when you testified uh, in front of Congress, I honestly felt like Elon Musk should have been there too. And, and I don't know who made this decision, who decided you know, who was gonna come forward, but it does seem like to me, it seemed pretty, uh, pardon my language, it seemed pretty shitty of him to just kind of walk away and not back and support the journalist that he basically hired to do this job. Yes, uh, and he, but here's another um, nuance of this whole thing, which is that, you know, the, the relationship between sources and journalists is politically neutral. Like, however I feel about sources, I, sometimes you like them, uh, sometimes you think they're inspiring, sometimes they come forward for reasons that are noble, sometimes they come forward for reasons that are horrible, right? Uh, but none of those things really impact what you're doing. The The issue always between you and a source is, do you trust them? And is the stuff accurate, right? And with Elon, it was unusual because we didn't actually have to evaluate his trustworthiness that much. Like there, there was a possibility that we were being, you know, there was like a forced deck situation going on where we were getting certain material and not others. But we didn't think that was happening, or if it was happening, we took precautions to limit the damage of that. Um, yes, at the beginning, I, I had hopes that he actually was a, a free speech champion. And there were things about his personality at first that I, I thought were appealing. Among other things, I think he bought the company sort of as a joke, which I thought was funny. Um, but there were other things that were a little troubling, right? And then as soon as he started you know, banning other journalists and everything, we had to come to terms with the fact that that was an issue. However, it wasn't an issue with the Twitter file story because we weren't talking about Elon Musk. If we had come out and said, Twitter is a brand new ball game, this is a free speech paradise, and here's what it used to be like, which is horrible, um, mm -hmm. even though he implied that uh, in his own reports, we didn't, um, and we didn't have to. Uh, so yes, it was disappointing, and the, and the way things turned out with me and him was certainly disappointing. I mean, that was that was really depressing. But you know, as far as I'm concerned, these things happen with sources. Like, and, and the 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 thing that I that I had to really worry about is this stuff true, and were they giving me something that was going to make me you know look bad because it was fake that was okay. Like that part of it turned out to be fine. And as a result, I'm happy with the story overall. I just, you know, there were some other little things that are a drag, but they're just personal drags for me. Matt, some people feel like uh, after the Twitter files, uh, some people have said that you are now on the right, that you're now right wing. Um, I want to hear from you about, you know, where you feel you stand uh, politically. And one of the things I have reminded people is that you are a journalist and it's really not your job to present 
one side of a political spectrum. I think some people have difficulty understanding that. I think where people may get that impression from you is because, you know, you were part of the Bernie, you know, coalition. And so they were like, okay, Matt Taibbi describes himself as an old school liberal, but he was a part of that Bernie coalition. And so I think they expected you to only call out things that were bad, that were happening on the right. Uh, and I think what happened with the Twitter files, some people saw that and they're like, oh no, Matt Taibbi's uh, covering for conservatives now. He's now a part of them. Where do you feel you stand politically today? Well, I've always been kind of coy about what my actual politics are. I, I actually don't even really... Not terribly interested in politics. I, I went into journalism because it was the family business and I really liked writing and I liked the process of it. Um, there's things about the job that I really like, uh, but I always try to separate that from you know, what my personal political leanings are. Uh, in, in the past, whenever I've covered stories, I mean, the, the job is to be honest, right? So when I had to cover the 2008 financial crisis, for instance, um, I didn't know a whole lot about it going into it. And, but then when I did, I discovered that, well, there was a lot of culpability on the democratic the side of the De democratic party with what happened. And the bailouts were really, really uh, unfortunate from the standpoint of uh, the new administration of Barack Obama, who I really liked at the time. Um, there was a very crooked deal involving Obama and Citigroup. Um, you know, he put a, a buddy of his from Citigroup in charge of, the, of his economic transition while the bailout was being negotiated. And look, that's just part of the job. You have to put that stuff in there because, you know, that's what happened. Same thing when I, when I wrote a book about Eric Garner, you know, there's obviously a lot of stuff about Republicans on Staten Island who I think contrived to fix the case uh, for the police officer involved, but there was also negative stuff about Democrats in general and about community policing and broken windows policing. Um, and this sort of paternalistic social programming that really, really, uh, stressed him out at the end of his life. There were inspections that he had to go through and, oh, and the big one was that, you know, he had gone to prison during a mass incarceration boom that was started by Mario Cuomo, who, you know, and this is stuff like this you have to do, right, as, as a journalist. Now, when Trump got elected, I expected to do a lot of reporting on Trump, uh, but immediately, even at, the, at a very cushy job like Rolling Stone magazine, I ran into all these taboos that it made it very difficult to, to manage, like the Russia story, like, how do you cover the rush, you know, Trump, if you don't think that story is true and everybody at your magazine does. And over the years, um, you know, I think that problem has gotten worse. Like for instance, I, I, there's a huge class element to how people call, uh, cover Trump. Um, there's a constant uh, mixing of, you know, going after Trump, and confusing that with the legitimate rage of people who support him for because they've been screwed over 50 different times, because they've been sent to pointless wars, because they've been ripped off in, in uh, financial schemes. I mean, I met these people on the campaign trail. I don't agree with their political decision, but you have to understand why they voted for the guy, right? And 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 now it, it, there's there's just this requirement that you that you you stand up and salute this one approach to covering politics, which is Trump bad, this side good. And I, I just can't get along with it. And I, and I have one of those personalities that hates to be told what to do. So I do go the other way, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a part of the problem is the fact that people do assume, especially in social, the social media age, a lot of people times they, they assume, well, so-and-so covered this story, so that means that they must take the side of, you know, the person that they're, they're complaining, the person that they're complaining uh, for, or, the, but you're just telling a story. And I think sometimes, particularly with a lot of journalism that's on social media, uh, people have started to see that, like, for example, uh, with Tucker Carlson, we all know that Tucker Carlson is right wing. He came from Fox News, started his own you know, news company, et cetera. So there are certain positions that people are going to expect him to take. Right. But then there are journalists like 
like yourself. <laughs> there were journalists like Walter Cronkite, like where you just cover the information that you're giving, you just cover the facts. And it doesn't necessarily mean that just because you're criticizing the Republican party, that you are supportive of the Republican party. And I think that that piece has been missing uh, from quite some time because we have been sensationalized by people that call themselves journalists like Rachel Maddow, for example. We all know where Rachel Maddow stands politically. And this falls back on some of the fault between like MSNBC, CNN, and Fox News of having that type of political ideology represent the news in the first place. Why do we have a right-wing news outlet and a liberal news outlet? Why can't they just all coalesce and just tell the news? Yeah, and I, I warned about this. You're absolutely right. And and as far back as 2016, I said, we're going to end up with a situation where we have right-wing media that covers corruption in the, among the Democrats and mainstream media, which covers corruption by Republicans. And that is going to be a completely useless model for journalism because uh, each respective audience will not see the derogatory information about their own uh, party. And this is one of the reasons why, you know, I still have like a little bit of credibility left with uh, people on the left, I guess you would call it. I mean, I, I hate to use that term because that's not really accurate. I, I see the Democratic Party is not left at all. Um, but, uh, over there, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to, I've been trying quite hard actually to get people to pay attention to, for instance, these first amendment issues, which they would have cared about 10 years ago, but in the Trump context have been rebranded. There's this whole, whole idea like Trump equal you know, constitutional rights equals, uh, helps Trump equals bad. Right. Um, you know, so there's been this sort of broad scale attack on everything from, you know, the right to speech and assembly to the right to counsel, to due process, to unreasonable searches and seizures. And, um, you know, the, the prohibition uh, other, I'm trying to think of the other one, the, the other prohibition, no excessive fines and penalties. Um, there's, I think about things like the 65 project where they're going after every lawyer uh, who represented Trump after the 2020 election, like they're finding ethics complaints and filing them against every single one of them, which to me violates things that I learned as like a liberal growing up. Like you don't pick the person before you find the crime, right? Uh, or uh, you don't try to discourage people generally from having lawyers. Like there's all kinds of other ideas in there that make me nervous. And should make all liberals nervous. But right now, this picture is all, is mostly about, you know, violations that against sort of people on the Trumpian right. Although I would say the speech stuff also goes the other way, but people just don't pay attention to those stories. Yeah, that's a good point. I want to pivot into uh, Gaza. As you know, uh, the war in Gaza has been going on since October. Um, I've talked about it a lot on this show. I'm sure you know Katie. Katie Helper has been covering this uh, probably just about every live stream. She's really good on this issue. Same thing with the gray zone. I want to get your opinion about uh, the war in Gaza. Uh, how do you feel about what's happening there? There was just a statement from the Pentagon released that they do not consider to be what's happening in Gaza genocide. I strongly disagree. But how do you feel about that? And where do you stand on this particular issue? I'm probably generally in agreement with you. Um, you know, Israel Palestine is a story that I have never liked to comment on uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, I had some bad experiences trying to cover a couple of protests once upon a time that left a bad taste in my mouth. And the other thing is it's a very, very complicated story with a lot of history and I don't know anything about it. Like I would, I would love to just go there and learn uh, more about what's happening rather than opine from a distance. Like Ukraine, I know a lot of that stuff. I, you know, I lived in that part of the world for a long time. Um, but you know, this is an issue where, I just don't like to get in the, I, I find, I found throughout my career that no matter what you say, um, unless you have it hundred percent nailed down, uh, you, you get in trouble somewhere. And I, I just don't know enough about it to, to feel like I'm really an authority on it. You get in trouble about it with who Zionists? 
anybody. I mean, I, 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 I just, I don't feel like just like I have an obligation to talk about things that I haven't covered. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, I, there are issues that I spend a lot of time on and comment on a lot because I've covered those issues. I've made phone calls on those issues. Like, I feel like I know what I'm talking about. And with Israel and Palestine, there are elements of that story that make me uncomfortable. And I just, you know, the world, the world can go without my opinion on, on that matter, I think. I, I think I disagree with that, Matt. Um, I think um, genocide is is a serious, a serious, serious issue. I'll tell you, uh, Glenn, Glenn Greenwald told me one time, he said, uh, no one is an expert at everything. Like he, he had warned me about this. He said, nobody is an expert at anything. I don't care how long you've been doing this. Uh, so, you know, what, what it, it taught me is that if there's an issue that I, I don't know much about or I don't feel comfortable covering, I reach out to people who are experts on that issue. Um, um, I think it would mean a lot to especially a lot of people watching to hear, you know, how you feel about what's happening, because a lot of people do see you as a prominent voice uh, in, in independent media and they do value your work. And I don't think that you should have to be afraid uh, of the pushback that you're going to get. Just look at people like Aaron Maté and Max Blumenthal, for example. They get a lot of pushback. Uh, people smear them all the time, uh, but that doesn't stop them from speaking the truth. Right. I just I, I just can't sort of sound if there are things about this story that make me nervous. And I feel like, you know, it's the first rule in, in medicine is do no harm. So if I don't say anything, I'm not doing any harm. Um, you know, my job is to get stuff right and not get stuff wrong. So, you know, I, I, I understand that uh, there are people who would like to hear from me on this issue, but I don't have a whole lot to add on this issue. I'll, I'd be, I'd be regurgitating something that I got from somewhere else. And, you know, I, I, I'm not a news service. I sort of disagree with that whole conception. Like there are two or three things that I spend a lot of time on because, I cover them over and over again. I'm constantly talking on the phone with people and this issue just isn't one of them. I know that people feel like that's a, that's ducking, but that's the way it is. Well, you're a parent, Matt, right? Like, so you're a dad. How do you feel about the children? How do you feel about the kids that have been killed in Gaza? I mean, not good, but again, I, 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 I don't want to talk about this whole thing. I really, I just, don't. I mean, um, it's it's not as it's not a news story that I would voluntarily talk about. Uh, let's put it that way. If I went there and and did a story, then that would be different. But uh, right now, it everybody. I just don't feel like I need to be in the middle of it. There are a lot of people talking about it already. Um, you know, I just don't want to uh, chime in. Okay. Um, I, I want to move on to your article about Coleman Hughes, because uh, I do feel that this is connected. So I saw um, the article that you wrote about Coleman Hughes. Uh, I'll just read the headline here. On the view, a crack finally shows in the propaganda uh, facade. And you were talking about this appearance that Coleman Hughes had on The View. So first and foremost, I'm not a fan of The View. <laughs> I'm not a fan of The View. I've been very critical about, uh, it's, it's, it's cringeworthy for me, uh, about uh, the things that those women discuss on the show and the way that they discuss it. There's one piece uh, from the article that I did highlight that I did want to ask you about here. Let me bring this up here. Hope you guys can see it there. This piece here, it says Hughes in the end of race politics calls bull on the bait and switch. He describes how perceptions about racial progress steadily improved in America until 2013 when they began a bizarre sudden descent. He argues this was due at least in part to the smartphone revolution and American sudden ability to see videos of episodes like the murder of Eric Garner. Uh, so I want to get your take on that. Um, how did you feel about uh, what Coleman Hughes said on The View? And I do have um, something to add here about uh, the smartphone revolution here. Well, I'm not sure that I, I mean, it's indisputable that racial attitudes did start changing at that time. I think all the data shows that. Uh, well, how people, how people feel about racial attitudes. Like every poll that you see taken 
uh, shows that nearly every demographic thought that race relations started to get worse right around that time. And they had been improving for pretty steadily, uh, at least perceptions, right? Of them, mm. uh, up, up until that moment. Now, again, I, I wrote a book about the Garner case. I'm not sure that that's a, an explanation for why it suddenly got worse. I think there are many others uh, that would come into play. Um, you know, number one, you know, might be, um, you know, Barack Obama being elected president, right? Uh, there were probably negative feelings associated with that, that, that came to the surface after being long suppressed. Remember, he had gotten a lot of votes in those Reagan Democrat districts in 2008 and then lost a lot of them in 2012. So what happened there? I, um, I don't know. Uh, there's also just the sort of overall issue, which has been observed in most parts of the world, which is that as we see an increasingly globalized economy, there's resentment towards pe the places where jobs have been to where uh, jobs have been exported. Right. So uh, you have a town in Ohio, where people were working for $30 an hour at an axle plant, and then they wake up one day after NAFTA, and that factory has been moved to Mexico, where people are working for a dollar an hour. Well, it's not terribly surprising that you might see negative feelings towards immigrants after that, right, or increase. Um, and especially on the campaign trail, you know, covering, I covered Romney, um, McCain and Obama in 2012. And I definitely noticed there was this surge in kind of generalized anger uh, among voters on both sides of the aisle. Um, mm -hmm. It wasn't necessarily racial, but you could see that it was directed just at politicians in general. And I, I would think that th it's, it's part of that whole matrix is is probably where things started to go wrong. But I, I don't know. What's your opinion on it? I would say um, I, I go back to uh, the Rodney King uh, beating uh, be before, way before smartphones, kids, for younger people in the chat, way before smartphones. But I remember seeing that on national television. And that was uh, a real, I think, eye opener uh, to a lot of people. Um, but I think some of these things have just been kept hidden or they haven't been broadcasted. So, for example, if you go to some of the communities, my family's from Baltimore uh, originally and my extended family members that still live in Baltimore, they still live in poverty. They live in very bad areas. I don't know if you've ever been to Baltimore, but it's a yeah. hot mess. Yes, yeah. no, it's all like this. And, uh, you know, they still they've constantly dealt with these things, but there wasn't uh, an outlet uh, before social media. News reporters would come to the neighborhood and they'd only report like a short snippet. They would take like uh, quotes from people in the neighborhood about certain things that happened. But then late at night on the news, they would decide not to show those clips. You know how it works. Uh, but sure. Yeah, and then then, after Katrina, it was the same thing. Like, you know, exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Like Katrina was a big eye opener for some people, how the government just didn't care. Um, we see the same thing with uh, Lahaina uh, in Hawaii, how long it took for the government to respond, but they can respond quickly with giving aid to Ukraine, for example. Uh, so we've seen it in, in a number of different areas. Uh, but I, I think for me, um, the reason why I wanted to have this conversation with you is because I wasn't sure if you were familiar with who uh, Coleman Hughes actually was. I mean, apart from being a writer and, you know, I mean, he went to Montclair Public School. Why? What? Uh, what's the issue? Yeah. So oftentimes what will happen is that there are outlets and there are organizations that they will use people like Colvin Hughes. So they will use a black face to push forth with their agenda. So the first time I heard about Coleman Hughes is when he said, you know, not to talk about identity politics. And I think if you're saying that all across the board for all groups, then people can look at that and say, okay, this person is being consistent. But there were things about Coleman Hughes that I noticed along the way. And it was actually uh, this Z Squirrel account 
that actually reported and revealed a lot of this information. Uh, when the New York Times mass uh, assault hoax came out, Zionist propagandists like Coleman Hughes jumped on the claim of visual evidence of genital mutilation, including inserting nails, etc. Now, what they went on to say here is that the UN report confirmed it was a fabrication, but yet here was Coleman Hughes. He was actually going after Aaron Maté, and he basically said, I'm eager to see how this assault denial brigade will explain nails, et cetera. Not going to get into all that. Aaron was saying, dear member of the genocide apology brigade, uh, let's assume that this is not yet another Israeli government lie, unlike beheaded babies, baby in the oven, et cetera. He goes on to say down here, you're asking me to take the word of a genocidal government and its media mouthpieces. I'll pass until we get some actual evidence. And the point that uh, Z Squirrel pointed out here in that exchange, it goes on to say that uh, Coleman Hughes tried to browbeat Aaron into submission by saying that it wasn't an Israeli regime propaganda claim. It was the New York Times. Surely you can't believe the New York Times would fabricate this. That's what Coleman Hughes said, but they literally did. And so Aaron actually was proven right here when he came down and said, as for the allegation itself, it's one line in a New York Times article claiming to have seen photographs. Whereas the forensics investigation of this woman's body, was it possible explanations could be for uh, the nails? These are basic questions that an independent investigation would answer. A uh, long story short, the gray zone actually had debunked this early on. And then later on, the intercept uh, came out and debunked debunk this. Coleman Hughes has written uh, a number of articles uh, defending uh, Israelis and the, the state of Israel. So when I hear someone say, don't talk about identity politics, don't focus on race, and it's always in reference to when black people are trying to make some type of progress in this country, that person like Coleman Hughes, a black face is pushed forward to speak out and say, no, 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 don't focus on that. Every time there's an issue or some type of uh, movement uh, towards black people getting progress in this country, he came out against reparations uh, for a dis American descendants of slavery. However, when it came to Israelis, Coleman Hughes is totally fine with identity politics. Not only did he defend them, not only did he support them, but Coleman Hughes till this day will not say that, you know, survivors of the Holocaust should return the reparations that they receive. I don't think he would say that Japanese Americans that were in, or part of the in, internment camps in this country and their descendants should return the reparations that they received. So the point that I, I wanted to explain to you is that oftentimes this is what the media will do. This is what powerful people will do in this country. They will use a face like a Candace Owens. They will use a face like a Coleman Hughes to push forth that agenda. But if you notice when you change the group of people from black Americans to Israeli Americans, for example, all of a sudden identity politics is fine. Okay. I mean, I, I just disagree that I have to agree with a person about everything. Um, you know, I, I, I read Coleman's book and it's a pretty straightforward and, you know, candid memoir very narrowly focused on this one issue of, uh, you know, do we accept the idea of racial harmony and colorblindness as an aspiration, uh, or do we think that that's not possible? And again, you know, I even just 10 years ago, I was interviewing lawyers from the ACLU and the, uh, and the NYCLU who had risked their lives to try to get race out of the law, uh, the last vestiges of segregation in places like Arkansas. Um, and the idea then that was the dominant one uh, among liberal America was we want race neutral law uh, because we believe in common humanity among all other things, uh, above all other things. And that was the message that, that, I, that I grew up, that I found inspiring. And I think, you know, that he was saying something that was, I thought, very timid on that show and got a lot mm -hmm. of hostility for it. And I was just pointing out that as a, mat as a factual matter, uh, we're often told that those ideas are not popular, uh, but when they're given voice on a show like 
uh, the view, you hear the audience applauding them. And I, I might disagree with them about other issues. I might, I'm, I might disagree with them about every issue, but, but that, but, uh, you know, I'm not endorsing the whole human being every time I do it. I mean, it's similar to the Elon thing. Uh, you know, yeah, I worked with the guy to, to do the Twitter files, but that doesn't mean that I endorse every one of his views. Um, nor should it, I don't think. But do you think, uh, do you think Coleman's belief of a colorblind society, do you believe that's something that's possible? Well, first of all, I, I disagree that he's saying that we have a colorblind society. He, he's, he's very, he's, he's very particular in saying, I talk about this as an aspiration, as something that we should be shooting for. Mm -hmm. And we, we all see race. There's no way to not see race. Uh, but this was the, the idea behind the I Have a Dream speech that we've all seen a, a million times. That, yes, we, we want to get to a point where race means so little um, that we can all live together. And it's just not that big of, it's not any bigger of a deal than eye color. I thought, I thought that was the idea. Uh, and I don't think that's, you know, a terribly controversial idea. I think it's, I think it's an, a, a kind of a beautiful idea. I don't, un I don't understand why uh, it's controversial. I think the thing is, is that if we wanted to get to that place as a society, I think there are certain institutional uh, systems in this country that have to change, right? So like the education system, the healthcare si system, uh, criminal justice system, like all the, a lot of these things have to change. But the problem is when a lot of us that are activists, when we come forward about like these are, these systems are flawed and here's why, and we need to change these systems. It is people like Coleman that will push back against the change. So I think for me, it's one thing to say you want reform, but it's another thing to say that you actually want to break the system and build something that is new. And so that's that's just where I'm coming from from it. Like I'm like, if if you want to envision a colorblind society, I think there are some wrongs that need to be corrected in this country. I think there are people in this country that need some type of repair. And I also think that the systems that are in place in this country have to change, especially the criminal justice system, because as long as those things remain the same, then how are we going to move forward to that type of society? That's just my take. Well, no, I, I, I agree with that. I mean, again, I, I wrote two books about the criminal justice system. So just to take an example, um, in New York, I, f I believe it was in 2008, 70% of the drug crimes were committed by white people. Uh, but you know, the, the percentage of people who were the per percentage of arrest was askew almost exactly in the opposite direction. Uh, the, the difference being that we were, they weren't doing stop and frisk on wall street. They weren't opening people's uh, briefcases and pulling out their little Coke baggies, which everybody knew that they had, right? Um, because the the subjective definition of probable cause, which cops were allowed to have, thanks to the you know Ohio v. Terry ruling in, in 1968, was being you know sort of disproportionately applied. And that absolutely is an injustice. Same thing with sentencing. Same thing with bail. You could go right down the line. All those things do need to be changed. On the other hand, you know, I, I did a story last year in um, uh, Loudoun County, Virginia, where there was this huge controversy over the gifted admissions programs uh, in this very wealthy, one, the wealthiest county uh, in America, where the problem was uh, it was being dominated by South Asian immigrant families uh, you know, something like 70% of the people who were getting into those programs were Indian or Chinese. Uh, and they changed the program to set to essentially force the, the percentages to fit the demographics. And, you know, that was deeply unpopular in that region. And it was a huge contributing factor to Terry, Mc to, to, the you know, Terry McAuliffe losing the election. Um, I'm not sure how I feel about that. I mean, I think th that's the kind of thing where I'm I'm not quite so comfortable about the reform. Um, and we, you know, people can have differences about that, 
But I still think the idea that, yeah, the, ultimately the goal is we want to get to a place where, you know, it's all fair and, and, and none of this matters. I think it's interesting what you brought up about emissions too, because one of the things, one of the things I've been kind of screaming about for quite some time that isn't talked about as much is legacy emissions. And it, it happens at, particularly at these, uh, the Ivy league institutions, like the Harvard, the Yale, the Princeton, like the legacy admission is a problem. And I wish people were screaming to the rooftops about that as well, because it's really not fair that just because your parent, Bill Ackman, for example, right? So Bill Ackman wanted to complain about plotting gay for plagiarism, et cetera, then come to find out that his wife also was that was now being accused of plagiarism at from MIT. So very similar things here. But at the same time, it's like just because your dad is who he is or just because your mom is who they are, that you automatically are admitted. And, and that's not fair. And I, I've disagreed with that for quite some time because you can be a subpar student. And I've seen this having worked in universities for years. You can be a subpar student. And because your parent is a legacy, you can still get in. Well, I mean, look at George Bush. I mean, uh, we, we see how that works out. I, I agree <laughs> with that. But at the same time, I, I don't agree with artificially lowering the number of Asian kids who get into college um you know I, I i just don't see that as a solution uh especially again after people fought so hard to get that kind of thing out of the law um it it feels like a step backward to me uh to to, to do that um but i you know i mean i agree with you about the the legacy admissions uh but you know the other thing is is more in the, in the Ibram Kendi realm, and I'm I'm just not I'm not sure that that I agree with the I with the this this concept that all inequities are uh, based on racism, and therefore we have to we have to fix them, um, uh, you know, using proactive discrimination in the other direction. Like I, I think that's a step back, but that's yeah, just my I opinion. I've critiqued Kendi on the show too, because I used to work at Boston University. So I remember when he got that position. <laughs> I was right. still working when he got that position. So I remember some of the things that he said. I was just kind of like, I think this guy's just trying to write some books. Right. You know, so there were some criticisms that I had uh with him as well. Um, but I, I think that what what is really scary to me is that I do feel like now we have gone into this realm where there's a lot of people saying that, well, not a lot of people, but there is now this thing where if there is a black person in a leadership position, they're called a DEI hire now. And that's been going all around on social media, this assumption that the person, they said this about the mayor from Baltimore who was elected. Uh, <laughs> it's just really weird. You know, so now there is that perception that you actually didn't get that position because you were qualified. You got that position uh, because of the color of your skin. And I, I, I wonder, you know, like I've had criticisms about that as well. I've had criticisms about DEI in the hiring, some of the hiring process. Um, and I've had criticisms about uh, Kendi because of the way that he went about going some things. I think it just kind of gives the perception that like, well, no, this needs to be done just because. And now I see where people are getting attacked, like people are being criticized because they're in the, now this is being said about random people, people I've never heard of before. All of a sudden they're on social media and this person's like, that person's a DEI hire. I'm like, did anybody look at their background to see, look at their resume to see if they were qualified for that? But you know, it's just like, because you see a black person, you just assume. Well, right. Yeah. And that's unfortunate and wrong. Um, and it's something that it's the kind of thing you see when, I mean, there's all different kinds of ra racism. There's the kind that expresses itself as anger. Oh, I'm that I'm paying taxes that go for social services. Never mind that I'm sitting on a Medicare-funded scooter as I complain to you. This is a common thing that that I, I ran into on the campaign trail. Uh, but you know, those other people are lazy and parasitical, and and uh, don't des you know, there's deserving people and undeserving people. Um, that's, you know, that's one form of it, uh, and it's horrible. And, you know, this whole idea of, you know, everybody who gets a good job is a DEI hire, uh, is another part of it. But, you know, there's an element of that, which is, you know, would that be true if there wasn't so much DEI? Like, I, you know, the, the, it's, it's hard to parse some of these things, right? Like I, you know, and I'm no expert on it by any means, but it's, 
uh, it, it's there are a few difficult questions in there. I just think I just think the the the, the one thing that for me isn't difficult is the idea that it, we should be aspiring to you know uh, uh, to get along and to have a colorblind society. Hmm. It's interesting, Matt. Uh, one thing that was said uh, recently as well uh, in reference to, push this down, sorry, in reference to uh, social media, uh, do you feel that social media is now the new journalism? Because like there's a big thing with the TikTok generation where people say they just want like these two minute news clips. So that's one of the reasons why TikTok is incredibly popular. Do you feel that's the way that journalism is going in the future? What just with TikTok? Yeah, like the, just like the two the two minute quick news clips that people do. Hotspot does these on uh, Twitter as well. Yeah, you know it's funny. In the nineties, I don't know. You probably you might not remember this, but there was this whole uh, phenomenon that burst into the magazine world in the mid nineties. Uh, there was this lad mag invasion from England. And the new idea was that people's attention spans couldn't handle anything longer than 400 words. So we had to put everything in 400 words and it had to be a box like this big in, in, in a page because people didn't want to read. That was the premise and they wouldn't. And therefore, let's just keep making things smaller and uh, have bigger pictures. And it turned out that that's not the case. I, I think we always underestimate audiences. Audiences actually do like to be challenged. Um, and you have to make it interesting. I mean, that's, that's one of the problems, like, ha you know, having covered, uh, subjects like military accounting or mortgage backed securities that are almost impossible to make interesting. Um, you do have to find creative ways to do it, but I, I think people, you know, ultimately are, will be bored by that. And the thing that I'm, I do worry about is that, the all of these new social media outlets they're designed to kind of hollow out your capacity for analyzing uh information like TikTok is designed to reduce the entire online experience to just next 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 like you're not even reading there's not even links half the time you're just scrolling staying for a while and then moving and and that's it and it's the algorithm that's making all the decisions they're not even sending you to other users so after doing that enough times people will lose their ability to do the hard work of reading which requires you to put images together in your mind and do and keep track of stories and all these other things and i do worry a lot about that yeah I, i've been noticing that too and i'm like are people going to go further than this that little short video and look up more information on their own or are they just going to go by what that little short video says so i i do worry about i, I like TikTok, but i do worry that people aren't going to venture further than like the two or three minutes uh for the new segment that they see right right and the the other problem is that even if they want to where where would they go i mean uh the the big problem now that we have in, in in media is that apart from podcasts really which haven't been locked down as much as every other kind of media um you know the sort of deranking algorithmic uh control of what people see is so stringent and so much better than it was before that it's just very difficult to find kind of counter narrative information uh even if you're looking for it. So um, I worry about that a lot as well. Well, Matt, are you interested in um, uh, probably maybe at some point having another conversation with Bree where you guys can talk a little bit? Because the only thing, one thing I will say about rising and you know, this is like your time is like, you have, you have a short amount of time, <laughs> like say what you have to say, and then you got to go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, uh, I reached out to rising and but you know, again, I'm pretty old school about this. Like, if you make a factual mistake, you gotta you gotta correct it. And if they're not gonna do that, um, you know, if I go on again, then I'm just then I'm just uh, owning, um, endorsing the error. Uh, so I, I I'm not sure about that. Um, what if it were bad faith instead? But you know, again, it, it, she. 
she she's been really frosty about even answering the the basic query uh and i i don't know maybe maybe i'm just getting old but it's pretty serious to to make a mistake and not correct it i mean i i just i don't understand that at all um at, at, as a journalist i don't understand why you, you would do that um and maybe you can help me out with that like why why would you just not fix it uh if if you if you've made a mistake i don't know matt i don't know <laughs> you're asking me <laughs> right I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Um, I just, I, I, I like the work that both of you have done and um, I just, you know, hope there's a way to move forward. Yeah. I mean, she won't even talk about it. So, I mean, if you can, if you can broker that, I'd be happy to, but um, yeah, I, I think, I think that's gone as far as about as far as it can go. It's too bad. I love, I really like the show and I like the, the premise of the show. But, um, you know, it's, a, it, I, this is an issue that I, that I feel kind of strongly about. And I think it's one of the reasons why, um, you know, a lot of different news outlets are losing audiences because, uh, they had, there's this phobia about, you know, correcting mistakes and, um, yeah, and, and. And frankly, it was about me, so maybe I'm taking a little bit personally too, but I should. So, uh, yeah, that I, I never saw you that, uh, I never saw you that upset. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's a bad quality. You should never allow yourself to get angry, angry on the air, as you know, it doesn't look good on video, but, um, but yeah, no, I was upset for sure. All right, Matt, uh, last question. People have been asking since the moment you jumped on screen, people are asking, is the goatee coming back? People, <laughs> people saw the goatee on Rising. They were like, hey. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I, I want to be one of those people who who can grow a really long goatee, but I, I don't know how the, the men who are watching feel. Uh, I, I get to a, a place where the itch factor just becomes unbearable and I just can't get past it. Um, it's like, uh -huh. it's, it's like 20 days or something like that. Uh, it's so, uh, I, uh -huh. I just hit that just before your show. So, oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I don't have to worry about us. I don't have to worry about that. Us ladies don't have to worry. <laughs> You're lucky. You're lucky. All right, Matt, anything else you got coming up or story wise? Um, no, uh, I mean, I've got some things coming out in a couple of weeks, but you know, I'll, I'll. I'll ping you when th those are about to come out. So, uh, but thanks very much for having me on. I appreciate it. Cool. Thanks so much. Bye. All right. Take care now. All right, guys, we will have a call in tonight after the show. You guys know we started doing that on zoom uh, last week. So we'll do that on Zoom again. I, I think it worked out okay. Some of you actually uh, contacted me and you said you actually prefer Zoom better, which is good because the call-in app is no longer a thing. <laughs> so that's a good thing. Uh, but yeah, so we'll do call-in after the show, you know, skadoodle. But I do want to go ahead and let's go through the comments. We'll shout out other stories and then we'll continue on tonight. If you haven't had a chance to do so, folks, go ahead and smash that like button. If you're new, don't forget to like, sub, and share. Let's go ahead and dive right in. Folks, there's a lot of comments pinned here. Uh, thank you, New York Varsity, for the super chat. This is about Bree's hang up about Elon Musk. There is a pattern here. You would have thought he stood her up at in international school prom. International school prom. Okay, that's weird. Um, <laughs> thank you for this one. And this is the difference between journalism and punditry. Critical thinking is not a team sport. If you don't know who they voted for, he is doing his job. He doesn't have a MAGA license plate. Thank you for that. Thank you, Sparky. Sabby, what are you doing having a mere so-called journalist on? <laughs> thank you for this one as well. Just kidding. I'm glad to see that Matt is finally standing up for himself. Thank you for this one as well. Love me some Sabby. That is really sweet. Thank you, Melissa. I respected the stance you took, Matt. You seem like an honest journalist, and sometimes you've got to push back on people, especially those on your side. Good on you. Let's make open discussions great again. 
I just like for people to be able to conversate. Uh, thank you, Sparky. Seems like Trump still gets most of his info from bogus sources, such as people around him and legacy media. As a boomer, he watches traditional TV news and thinks it's not always misleading when it is. Yeah. <laughs> well, he did call it fake news. Remember that? And I guess... I don't know. Maybe he forgets he said that. Thank you for this as well. Is Matt taking the deafening silence route on Palestine slash Gaza? Sounds kind of like it. Hope he learns enough about it to confidently take a righteous stand. We'll see. Yeah. Thank you, Sparky. Free Garland Nixon's egg. Yes! Free Garland Nixon's, Nixon's uh, Twitter account. It's wild. Garland Nixon still has a Twitter page, but they basically locked him out of his account. So if you search for him on Twitter, you'll find him, but you won't see any new posts because he's locked out. Thank you for this as well. Sabby came through with a great interview where Brianna failed. Great work, love, Sabby. I don't like to say people failed, you know, and take knocks at people um, on this show, that kind of thing. You know, uh, I think we all have different styles. I think Brie has a different style. I think I have a different style. And we all we all have made mistakes. I've made mistakes on the show as well. Thank you for this as well, Sparky. In Matt's defense, he doesn't have to, he doesn't have the goatee to protect him for this interview. I'm kind of kidding, but I know some people feel less vulnerable depending on what they wear. For instance, interesting. Thank you for this as well, Newsom slash Kushner 2024. Yikes! And thank you for this. Go Yemen, fight the power. Thank you for this as well, New York. Sabby, you're an activist. He is a journalist. Some are both, like Abby Martin. He chooses not to opine on things he does not know, which is not the same as on their side. Your interview skills rock. Oh, thank you for that. Um, thank you, Sparky. Say what you will, but Hotspot is pretty effective getting info across. Yeah, I love those Hotspot clips, man. I love them. They're rocking them. Nick and Nico are rocking those clips. Shout out to Randy for the super sticker. Uh, and thank you for this one, Sparky. Every time anyone says that Israel is our only friend in the Middle East, I can't help but think that before Israel, we had no enemies in the Middle East. Ah, U.S. missionary John Sheehan. Thank you for that. All right, I'll take the comment on Rockfin, Eric. Thank you. Thank you for the tip on Rockfin, Dave. Much respect to Matt Taibbi. Long admired a lot of his work, especially on dangerous, dangerous, excuse me, government agencies and dangerous shadow government agencies, criminal intelligence services practices. Thank you so much for that. Let's go ahead and show that beautiful thumbnail, folks. Someone at, was asking, you know, uh, Eric is trying to help me get better with some things around here that I forget to do during this show. Someone was asking about Patreon, and I don't even think I opened the Patreon list. I'll have to go back to it. Anyway, tonight we are also discussing, of course, Matt Taibbi was just here. We're also going to discuss Abby Martin versus Pierce Morgan. Ay, ay, ay. Ay. Listen, these debates on Pierce Morgan show were something else. Grab you some popcorn for that one. We're also going to discuss Owen Jones goes off. Now, Owen Jones here, he's also uh, a commentator. He's a commentator in the UK. Uh, he has a debate as well in reference to Israel and Gaza, and he really does the damn thing. We're also going to talk about what's happening with him in reference to the Labour Party. I think you need to hear about that. And last but not least, Bernie and Debbie Weiserman Schultz rematch, <laughs> or as I like to refer to her as Top Ramen. <laughs> Top Ramen in the house. Okay, I don't think I pulled up the patron, so let me go ahead and take care of that. And I'm sorry for that, guys. It was literally one of those things where today was wild, man. Like, really busy day. And uh, that ain't the right one. Balls. Really busy day. I, I had um, weight training earlier. And then I had to go to... You guys know what Cole... Oh, my God. Listen to this. Do you guys know the Coles near me didn't have any cashiers? I went in there right after training. I'm like, let me go on Coles because, you know, I had to refill my concealer. That's a whole nother story. I'm like, let me just go to the Coles and pick it up. They have a Sephora in there. Get this. I walked in. Every cash register is empty. Like they're there, but the people are not there. So I was like, 
Okay. And I just came to get, you know, just grab and go, grab and go. So I walk up to the register and I'm like, there's nobody here. I see a guy bagging his own clothes and ringing himself up. So I go over to that dude and I'm like, okay, I guess he's like, you got to do it yourself around here these days. I was like, what is this? So get this. Apparently if you have, um, clothing items that have a sensor on it, then you have to press this little button and then a sales associate will come over to remove the sensor from your clothes. But I had, but you have to ring yourself up at Kohl's. Wild times folks. Let's go ahead and give a shout out to everyone who is a savvy patron. I told you they were placing people with these damn machines. All right. If you're interested in being a savvy patron, first of all, shout out to all of you. I have five categories, ultimate, Sabinators, Sabsters, Sabbies, and of course, members. All of their names are listed here. You can also see their names scrolling across the bottom of the screen there on the ticker. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. All right. Yeah, I know some of you in the chat are saying you would have walked out. I couldn't, I really hadn't, I needed it. I had to get it. It was one of those things, you know, man. Anywho, let's go ahead and move on to our next story. Am I in the right thing? Oh yeah, I am. Okay. Let's get into our next story. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I didn't think there would be a rematch of Bernie Sanders and Debbie Wiseman Schultz is really interesting, though they were not in the same room, mind you. Uh, they were mentioned to each other. At least Bernie was mentioned uh, to Debbie Wiseman Schultz. Now, we're going to get started with this interview with Bernie Sanders and D uh, Jake Tapper, basically calling for uh, stopping the aid going to Israel or a pause. This is, they're not calling for a permanent, you know, stoppage. They're calling for a pause. I just want to be very clear about that. Let's start off with this discussion with Bernie Sanders. And then we are going to shift into the conversation with Debbie Wiseman Schultz and Jake Tapper, because it is apparently right after he had this interview with Bernie, he had the interview with Debbie and is basically asking her if she's going to support Bernie Sanders position. Very interesting times, folks. The last time I remember these two having any type of a match was during the DNC fraud lawsuit. <laughs> but here we are again. Let's go ahead and get into this clip here. Oh, I probably have to refresh it. Sorry, guys. The Twitter clips do this sometimes, you guys, when it's been like on chill. And I'll just get it back to the 30 seconds because there's just certain things I don't want to show. And let's dive in here. Secretary of State Blinken today said that if the U.S. does not see changes to protect civilians in Gaza, there, quote, will be changes in our own policy, unquote. Do you believe them? I mean, I feel like we've been hearing this for a while. Well, I, I think you make a good point, Jake. Look, the bottom line is we are looking at one of the worst humanitarian disasters that we have seen in a very, very long time. We're literally, at this moment, looking at hundreds of thousands of children starving to death because Israel is not allowing the humanitarian trucks uh, into Gaza and especially into the areas uh, where people are in most desperate condition. Uh, to my mind, uh, Israel should not be getting another nickel in military aid uh, until these policies are fundamentally changed. So if, you know, my view is uh, no more military aid uh, to Israel when children in Gaza are starving. So the realities for the, uh, the political realities for Netanyahu, I'll get to the political reality for Biden in a second, but the political reality for Netanyahu is he depends, his prime ministership depends on the far right wing zealots, Ben Gavir and Smotrich, who are anti-Arab racists. He depends on them. He needs them to stay in power. He needs to appease them as Arab and Palestinian rights and lives are discarded both in Gaza and in the West Bank and in Israel. Is there any way towards a satisfactory end to this conflict as long as the prime minister of Israel is trying to appease the likes of Ben Gavir and Smotrich. So let me break down something that he just said there, guys. 
basically he's letting you know that the United States government, remember the U.S. government is supporting, they have been supporting it back in Netanyahu, right? It wasn't until the pressure from the outside, all of the protests that have been happening, uh, also the confrontations that Nancy Pelosi has had that, um, I forget the guy's name. What's the guy's name? Ah, shoot. It'll come back to me. Oh, Blinken. <laughs> that Blinken has had, et cetera. You know, you have to think like it's because of the pressure and the protests that have come from the people on the outside. I remember that is how you pressure politicians. It has to come from the outside because up there in Washington, the people that are inside Congress, they're not going to be the ones to do it. They were supposed to, at least the squad was supposed to, but they did not do that. So listen to this. What he's basically telling you is that the U.S. government was supporting racist, a racist government. Because it's not just those two gentlemen that he named that Netanyahu needs, it's also Netanyahu. And the U.S. government has been sending them those funds. Well, that's, the answer is no. Uh, and our job is not to worry about Netanyahu's political future. That's not our job. Our job is to make sure that American taxpayer dollars is not complicit in allowing Netanyahu's military machine to kill innocent people and to result in mass starvation. And I think what the people of Israel must understand, and I, I am pro-Israel, I support Israel, but... Pause. You see what's happening here, right? So Bernie is still doing both sides and you pay attention to what he's doing. He's calling out the racist government in Israel, but he's still going to tell you that he supports Israel. So he's still trying to have his cake and eat it too. He's still trying to play both sides. Bernie Sanders is never going to come forward and say that he condemns the state of Israel. He's never going to come forward and say that we should stop sending aid to Israel permanently He's just calling for pause. And why are they calling for the pause now? Nancy Pelosi just signed on to this, right? We're going to go a little bit deeper into that Thursday. Because of what happened to the humanitarian aid workers. That's why Nancy Pelosi signed on to it. Not because of what's been happening to the Palestinian people. It's because what happened to those humanitarian aid workers. So once again, our government has shown you time and time again who they choose to prioritize and who they choose not to prioritize. Let's go on. Bernie's trying to have it both ways. They cannot continue to wage this immoral war against innocent people and expect taxpayers of the United States to support them. That has got to end. We've got to move to a two-state solution. The brutality in the West Bank, as you just indicated, illegal activity on the part of the settlers must end if they want support from the people of the United States. Hopefully. Pause. So now he's calling out the settlements in the West Bank. He's calling that out, right? But he's still telling you that he supports Israel. Now you called out the forceful removal of the Palestinian people in the West Bank. You've called out uh, the genocide that's taking place in Gaza. You've called out the fact that Netanyahu has a racist right-wing government, but you still support them? Sounds like an abusive relationship. That's what it sounds like to me. Hopefully, hopefully that will give support to people in Israel who understand that this right wing extremism is bad for them and bad for their place in the world. What do you say to people? I asked this of General Hurtling uh, in the last hour. I get asked this and I, I wonder what you say. Because you are a supporter of Israel. You worked on a kibbutz when you were a younger man um, and you've always been pro-Israel. That doesn't mean pro-Netanyahu. Um, what do you say to people who say, this is not fair, it's a double standard, Hamas uh, started this on October 7th, Hamas wants mm -hmm. to destroy Israel, Hamas wants to kill Jews, Hamas um, hides behind their own people, Hamas doesn't care how many Palestinian civilians die, all of which, in my opinion, is true. What it is not true. Now, this is where Bernie Sanders should come in and push back that the, this did not start on October 7th. You're going to hear a little bit more about this with the Abby Martin debate, but this is where he should jump in and say that, but he won't. Listen. What's your response when people say that? I that would agree with you. Look, Look, Hamas, is, Hamas is a terrible, terrible terrorist organization that started this war. See? 
This is how Bernie Sanders maintains both sides. He'll say that we should pause the aid going to Israel, that the deaths need to stop. But he'll then also say that, yeah, this all started on October 7th. I agree with you. Bernie Sanders knows the history. Bernie Sanders knows what has happened to the Palestinian people. Bernie knows better. But that's not what Bernie is paid to do. So just keep that in mind. I don't like fence sitters. I don't like, you know, there's some issues where you can just sit on the fence, right? You know, it's like, do you want tacos tonight or do you want pizza? You can sit on the fence with an issue like that. Uh, I don't really care. I don't matter one way or the other. But you cannot sit on a fence when it comes to genocide. And that's what Bernie, he's trying to have it both ways. Let me straddle this fence. Let me call out the deaths that have happened. Let's say pause the aid we're giving to Israel. But this all started October 7th and uh, I support Israel. And some of you are probably telling me, even when it came to the tacos or the pizza, you probably would have to make a firm decision. But you know where I'm going. And what I have said from the beginning, Jake, it, Israel has a right to defend itself and go to war against Hamas. That's what I believe. I think most people believe. But you do not have a right to damage or destroy 70 percent of the housing units in Gaza. You don't. Pause. So, again. It's always that Israel has a right to defend itself. It's never that the Palestinian people have a right or Gaza has a right to defend their self. Did Gaza have a right to defend their self when Israel comes in every other couple of months and they decide to mow the lawn? Do they have the right to defend their self? Gaza doesn't have a military. There's a reason why a group like Hamas is formed in the first damn place. This is what happens when you try to occupy people. This is what happens when you oppress people. And again, they did not have a military. They were not allowing the Palestinian people to have full rights. Rights. They were not treating the Palestinian people as human beings. So what do you expect to happen? Bride Biscuit says, screw tacos. <laughs> I told you I knew some of you would actually have a firm position on the taco or pizza. You have a right to displace 80% of the population, throw them out of their homes, put them into this area, put them into that area, deny them food, water, medical supplies, and fuel. That you don't have a right to do. So, uh, the answer is, of course, Hamas began this war. They are a terrorist organization. But the but they've been removing people from their homes in the West Bank far before October 7th. And you still supported Israel. You know, you can't say, see, that's another thing I want to be very clear about, people. You cannot sit here, Bernie Sanders. You got to be careful because I don't want people to have this perception that the forceful removal of the Palestinian people that's happening in the West Bank right now started on October 7th. That was happening prior to October 7th. So I want to be very clear about that. The United States is not funding Hamas. We are funding Israel. And what has got to be made clear to Israel, you can go to war against Hamas, but you cannot continue these horrific actions, which are causing literally the worst humanitarian disaster that we have seen in a very long time. What do you say to people who say the reason that so many innocent people are dying in, in Gaza is because Hamas embeds with the Palestinian people. They build tunnels under their homes. They hide under people. They want uh, all the civilian death toll. They consider them martyrs, and it makes Israel look bad. I think that is perhaps a part of the problem, but it's not the real problem. The real problem right now is we are looking, as I mentioned a moment ago, a massive starvation that is not caused by Hamas. Uh, that is simply caused by Israel not allowing the hundreds and hundreds of trucks that are lined up at the border to get in and go to the areas that it is needed. That is Israel's responsibility, not Hamas's. I know you want to talk about um, your, your bill lowering prescription drug. One second there. The part that he just talked about in reference to the food and them hiding among the people, right? If this entire time they were hiding with the people, we've heard they're in the tunnels, we've heard they're in the hospitals, we heard they use the people as shields, 
We've heard they're right in there with the people. But all these people that Israel has killed, you mean to tell me they haven't been able to still capture Hamas? If you know they're in the tunnels, if you know that they're with the people, but yeah, you haven't been able to capture any of them because the goal really wasn't for them to capture Hamas. The goal was for them to get rid of the Palestinian people altogether. I think we'll finish with uh, this part here. Cross, but before I do, quick last question on Biden in the Middle East. What does Biden need to do in order to make this right politically in the United States for all the progressives and Arab Americans and Muslim Americans and others it's who not, don't approve? It, you know, to me, Jake, this is not a progressive is issue, an Arab American issue. It's a moral issue. Uh, we, our taxpayer dollars are funding a military which is creating a situation where there is mass suffering. I don't think the American people feel good about it. In fact, the last poll that I have seen is I believe 52% of the American people, as opposed to 39, want to end military aid to Israel. And that number is growing and growing. So I think from a moral position and from a political position, you know, President Biden, needless to say, wants to win this election. I want him to win this election. But it is very hard to go out and again, it's not just the Arab Americans, it's the young people, it's the people sure. in general who are seeing these terrible things on the TV screen. They do not want Biden to continue to do it. I think he's got to tell Netanyahu, sorry, no more money from American taxpayers. So Have a nice day. Let no more money from American taxpayers, but I think that that should be permanent. I, I just think that actually they're federal dollars anyway, but I just think that that should be a permanent position, not just no money we're going to pause this right now and then we're going to decide to give you money again. No, we shouldn't be funding them at all. We're not even funding people in this country the way that we should. We should not fund them at all. I don't care what happens after this. All aid to Israel should end immediately to any country. Massachusetts gives $125 million to Israel every year, but we got homeless people out on the street. Boston, the city of Boston gives $10 million, but we got homeless people out on the street. We got people that have housing inequality. We have people that can't pay their damn medical bills because the medical bills are so damn high. But you can't house people. You can't build housing here. But you got money to send to Israel. All aid should stop for going to Israel immediately from everyone. Period. They don't deserve it. We will take care of Americans. We'll take care of our people. Now, Debbie Wiseman Schultz, she actually had to respond because uh, Jake Tapper actually decided to, I guess, after that interview, lead into this discussion with Debbie Wiseman Schultz to see if she actually agrees with the position that Bernie Sanders has about pausing the aid to Israel. Let's listen to Top Ramen. So I'm, I'm interpreting that as a no, you don't agree that, that Israel should not get any more military aid until they change their policies, as Senator Sanders suggested. He, he said... The Congress is, but let me just, oh, okay. You're saying they did change their policies, but the, their, their overall policies in Gaza, they've, they've changed that. After, well, when president Biden spoke with prime minister Netanyahu, you know, after that very difficult conversation, Israel opened up the era's crossing and ensured another access point is stepping up humanitarian aid to make sure. Pause. So she's saying that Israel has changed their policies in Gaza. Uh, they were calling for them not to have the ground invasion. The U.S. government has said that to Netanyahu. He's had these conversations with Netanyahu and Netanyahu has said he is going to do a ground invasion regardless of what the U.S. government says. And now you get this hearing, this information that was released from the U.N. earlier today, where the U.N. is now saying there's no evidence that a genocide has taken place uh, in Gaza. Remember, we've heard this before. We heard this about Rwanda. Initially, they denied that there was a genocide taking place. Had to come back and eat the words on that. This is not the first time. It was just a couple of years ago that the U.S. government finally acknowledged the Armenian genocide. That was recent. The acknowledgement was recent. So we're not known for necessarily getting it right on this particular issue. 
So you see the Zionists now got a hold of the UN. They got some people in there running some things and you, you, very powerful organization of people. To the point where the UN, the UN can't even stand up because they're afraid. And I say to the UN, if you're not going to do your job, just step down, step down, go. Because at this point, I question what is the point of the UN at this point? Cowards. Or that more gets in, uh, had that investigation and had there be accountability and consequences as a result. And that's what needs to happen. More aid gets in. That's what we as a delegation communicated with the prime minister last week. But we also have to make sure that a deal is reached, that Hamas accept the deal on the table. It's a 10 to 1 ratio of Palestinian prisoners who are terrorists that killed Israelis to every one hostage. That deal needs Pay attention again. So notice how she describes the Palestinian people. Listen to this. You see? So Debbie, Debbie's a Zionist too. Okay? Listen to how she describes the Palestinian people. To make sure that more gets in. Uh, had that investigation and had there be accountability and consequences as a result. And that's what needs to happen. More aid gets in. That's what we as a delegation communicated with the prime minister last week. But we also have to make sure that a deal is reached, that Hamas accept the deal on the table. It's a 10 to 1 ratio of Palestinian prisoners who are terrorists that killed Israelis to every one hostage. That deal needs to be accepted so that there can be a, ce a ceasefire for six weeks and ensure that we can get the hostages out, get humanitarian aid in. The ball is in Hamas's court right now. Mm -hmm. So you hear this? So the point that he made at the beginning, notice how she refers to the Palestinian prisoners as terrorists, right? Notice how she can label them. The people doing all the terrorizing has been the state of Israel. They're the ones doing all the terrorizing. Anywho, what he was asking her at the very beginning is, do you agree with Senator Sanders' statement that the aid to Israel needs to be paused in the event they're not changing these policies? So instead of answering that question, she basically said they have changed their policies. So Debbie, of course, is not going to agree with pausing any type of aid uh, for Israel. Now, let me tell you something, folks, because the Biden administration has something to answer for. They got something to answer for. Because you see, they have been heavily counting on uh, the black vote for years. Democratic Party has. And the Biden administration, they really believe that they can go to historically black colleges in this country, just like they did in 2020. And they can just walk in and say, you got to support me. Otherwise, you know, you're going to end up with Donald Trump. But even when it comes to this issue with Gaza, I think they got a surprise. So let me show you what happened recently. This is interesting here. I don't think they were expecting this, but listen to this. It says arrived in Atlanta to meet Spelman College brilliant students and educators on foreign policy priorities and representing the United States around the world. So Spelman is a HBCU, all female uh, college. And so apparently this happened at Atlanta, the Atlanta University Center. Students, faculty, and alum condemned the Biden administration for complicity in Jaza. They weren't ready. They weren't ready. Watch this. Do you support an end to the genocide? Entire bloodlines wiped off the face of the earth, never to return again. Those are Palestinian lives and generations gone because of your administration that you work for. Shame. This is your legacy. This is your legacy. Will you call for your boss, Butcher Biden, to stop arming Israel? There's no discussion. It's a yes or no. Will you help put an end to the genocide? She put the mic down. She put the mic down. She's not, she don't know what to say. She wasn't ready. They weren't ready. They were not expecting that. So she just put it down and they called butcher Biden. You see, when they went to the HBCUs in 2020, this didn't happen because we didn't have this war in Gaza. And I think some people still weren't aware of how the Palestinian people were being treated. Things have changed now. She don't know what to do. She put the mic down. Is this a genocide or a conflict? I just want to know. Because according to international law, there is a correct answer. Disgusting. 
Nobody should be sitting on stage with her while she's promoting genocide. She lacks moral courage. None of us here lack moral courage. You spoke about the involvement of the Israel lobby in the U.S. politics, and now you're a part of it. <laughs> Gaslighting black students. Ouch. They said, How do you feel gaslighting black students? You guys see, they weren't ready. Simply, just how do you feel gaslighting black students? And these are not just students, you have alums in the audience too watching you all. <laughs> we call on all Hispanic students to join us in Black Power Generation Campus to not allow us to be used even if our alumni are not aware of wanted to be used. We will not be complicit in genocide. The answer is simple. Ooh, I don't think they were expecting that. So everybody heard the call, right? Everyone at HBCUs do not allow the Biden administration, the Democratic Party to use you to get your vote. You don't owe this man anything. You damn sure don't know him your vote. You don't owe him a reelection. And Thursday, we're going to talk about the student loan, the student loan um, proposal that he just introduced that he's trying to get past because he's trying to cancel more student debt. You see, he trying to find a way to win over those young voters that he got in 2020 because everybody pissed at this mofo because of the genocide. So now he's going to, we're going to talk about it Thursday because I want to dive into the bill a little bit more and read this very carefully, but I'm telling you, you didn't lost the young base, bro. As a black woman that is walking the same hallway that Alex Walker has walked, I cannot stay silent during a genocide. Shame on you. Both of you, you're discussing for Calling security on your black students, huh? Shame. 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 Shame on you. Were you on stage whispering about how you think hospitals are military targets? Or were you just key king because you don't care about human lives? Palestinians deserve better. Black people deserve better. And Spelman needs to do better. My sister's guys yeah uh you know the kids the kids are all right right the kids are all right the kids are pretty base man pretty base i hear you Dwayne. this is base yeah they think they can just walk into these universities pull the same old you know ploy that they did in 2020 people are not they weren't ready see they thought oh we're going into the black college the black college students aren't paying attention to what's happening in, in gaza wrong <laughs> wrong we'll just show up there and just tell them how we can't get trump again oh it's not working out not working out and she couldn't say anything nothing JB says they are fine people on both sides, Bernie Sanders. Thank you, uh, Carpe Diem. Sephora is Israeli owned. A lot of things are, unfortunately. A lot of things are owned uh, by Israel. Thank you, Janine. I think after the first hostage exchange, uh, Israel unalived the rest of the hostages they had in jails, and that's why the other exchanges didn't happen. That's an interesting point, Janine. Shout out to Jasmine for the super sticker. Janine also says chicken flavored top ramen at that old cup a noodle head ass. Yikes. <laughs> Thank you, Sparky. As bad as Netanyahu is, his replacement may be worse. So scapegoating him is just another delay tactic. All right. If you haven't had a chance to do so, smash the like. If you're new, don't forget to like, sub, and share. And we're going to move on to our first debate of the night. This is going to be pretty interesting. This is pretty based. Uh, Owen Jones, uh, he's from the UK. He actually hosts a show on YouTube called Owen Jones. Now, he was a part of the Labor Party. Uh, we'll get into why he has decided to leave the Labor Party. So, you know, there's a lot happening with Owen Jones. He is uh, waking up to some things and he is uh, he's going off. <laughs> he is going off. But he also actually had a debate on Sky News with Hen Mazig to discuss the war in Gaza 
Let's let's hear it for Owen Jones. Guys, if you don't watch him, watch check out his YouTube channel, uh, particularly the more recent videos, because like I said, Owen is has woken up to a lot of things, whether it's the Democratic Party, whether it's the Labour Party in the UK. And he has been pretty vocal and Owen has some things to say. Let's get in. Whatsoever. 40,000 Palestinians are likely to have been killed or more in Gaza because the official statistics exclude those buried under the rubble. Now, the point about Joe Biden and his position there, Joe Biden's hot air all the way through has been a defining feature of this conflict, so-called conflict, genocide and slaughter against the people of Gaza. Um, he has armed and backed Israel as it has caused so much destruction the vast majority, the, sorry, a large majority of Gaza's civilian infrastructure is now severely damaged or destroyed. So Gaza is now a different colour and texture when looked at from space, uh, where around 13,000 plus children have died violent, horrible deaths, either with their buildings coming down on top of them or being burned and cooked slowly to death or suffocated or both at the same time. Um, and that point, which I did think was editorialising on, on, on the part of your journalist, was that it was beyond any doubt or any reason that, you know, it was completely unthinkable that the US could pull the plug on arms because that would then pose an existential threat to Israel. That's in Israel's court. Israel has decided to starve the people of Gaza. The fastest drop in the nutritional status of a population in recorded history, the most severe. Let me pause just for a second. Did you notice how uh, Haas, you notice how Hen Mazig, notice how he looked away when Owen talked about the starvation. Notice how he looked away. Beer famine since World War II now beckons. You have people in the North at the moment who are starving to death and eating animal feed in order to live. As David Cameron, Foreign Secretary, not, not someone I naturally normally quote, detailed in a letter which led, I would, uh, I would note, to the sacking of the Israeli spokesperson Elon Levy, which is probably why you don't have him on your news channel anymore, is because Elon Levy made false statements about aid trucks being allowed in, which then David Cameron went through and said that wasn't true. Israel had gone to great lengths to stop them coming in. The point I'm making is Israel, all the way through this, has been raising civilian infrastructure to the ground. It has conducted the biggest killing of aid workers in recorded history. And the point I would make, and this is why I think there's a bit of journalistic malpractice, which is defined this conflict, Israeli leaders and officials were very clear from the very beginning about what they were going to do. They didn't hide it. You don't have to go through leaked documents. You just have to listen to, for example, to Yov Gallant, the defence minister, who's in the war cabinet of three, who said two days after the atrocities committed by Hamas on the 7th of October, um, that, uh, that they were going to cut off food, water, and all the essentials of life on the grounds they were fighting human animals. And then on the 9th of October, he declared he was lifting all the restraints on soldiers, and a day later, he said he was lifting all restrictions on Israeli soldiers. We've now seen that, and the impunity that Israel enjoys from the West has led to aid workers who shared their coordinates on a pre-approved route with massive World Central Kitchen logos who were chased from yep. car to car with the drone until every single one was dead. And I'll tell you this, if that's true with those aid workers, Palestinians, ordinary Palestinians, did not, don't have a chance. And Joe Biden has sat through well, all of this, wringing his hand occasionally whilst ensuring let, Israel has the answer. Let me, let me give you a chance. Let me come in and let him respond in just a second. But what I thought was really smart, what Owen did here, is that he didn't just talk about how the UK is has been complicit in this as well, right? He's also calling out the Biden administration's uh, being complicit in this genocide as well. But it is very obvious to me that when Owen walked into this debate, he showed up prepared. It was very clear to me that he did his research before he decided to walk into Sky News. He was just doing the damn thing, okay? So he was prepared. Now, let's see how Hen responds. Well, I'm interested that there's, there's a lot the, the, I'm sure some of the phraseology you won't agree with. But oh, quite a lot of this the is, facts as well. But, but some of this is facts, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, Gaza is being uh, are, absolutely... Are there like, no trucks going into Gaza? Is that what you're saying? There are no there, there's no trucks with humanitarian aid. You're saying that 7 million tons of food today did not enter Gaza. Israel is lying can, about that. I can that. answer that question very clearly. Um, Israel has destroyed much of Gaza's domestic food production and agriculture. Yeah. The amount of food aid, as David Cameron has noted, is much less than before the 7th of October, when the need is much greater. And not only that, the roads have been trashed, 
okay, for a start. Police officers, which guard those trucks, have been deliberately targeted by Israel with Joe Biden's own administration condemning Benjamin Netanyahu uh, for doing that. Whether yep. it comes to the infrastructure, get, or for example, the, the ability to transport in, uh, uh, the, the aid around is impossible now. Right. So I mean, th this is why the, the destruction a, of agriculture plus the, the inability to I get mean, the you take a pause, a second, yeah. you, you So you see what Hen tried to do? He tried to mention, he tried to say, are you saying that a truck didn't get into Gaza today? as if we're supposed to forget about everything that happened prior to the day that they had this debate. You know, it's just like they're trained liars. I'm, I'm just look, we're going to get into the Norm Finkelstein and uh, Dershowitz part two debate on Thursday because I haven't made it through all of that yet. But we're going to get into that on Thursday because you just see the train lies and they all continue to say the same thing. It's um, a lot of hand -hand. No, and, and, it's, and, it's and you know what? I, I do understand why this conflict raises a lot of emotions. I think we need to focus on reality. Uh, and I understand, especially when you are Jewish or Palestinian or Arab, why you feel so commit so connected to this conflict uh, and, and really being hurt and upset. I'm upset. My family, my friends, I lost friends in October 7th. Um, I don't understand why you are so. Uh, because I object to genocide. So do you see what he's you see what he's saying? So Hen, let me tell you, let me see you how show you how people show their whole ass, okay? So Hen is basically telling Owen that he understands why he has an emotional attachment. Hen has an emotional attachment because he's Israeli. He know he said he knows people that he was lost on October 7th. He understands why Palestinians are emotional about it, why Arab community may be emotional about it. But then he points to Owen Jones and he says, I don't understand why you are emotional about it. So what Hen is actually telling you is that the rest of us should not have any type of compassion for humanity. You know, he's basically telling you, you have to be Jewish or Palestinian to actually have some type of compassion or emotional connection or any type of emotion about what is happening in Gaza. Ain't that a bitch? Let that sink in, folks. Let that sink in. How cold can you be? so connected to this conflict uh, and, and really being hurt and upset. I'm upset. My family, my friends, I lost friends in October 7th. Um, I don't understand why you are so... Uh, because I object to genocide that, because I'm a human being. Uh, and of course it's not a genocide. Because I'm a human being. That's why would I you call every war a genocide? So he responds and he says it's because he's a human being. Then he replies back and says, oh, of course it's not a genocide. Or, or, so no, why is it I genocide? Because you're seeing the deliberate attempt to starve a population to death, which Israel's own leader said at the beginning of the I think we, we, we let, let's, Israel let's, is now on wait, trial at the International Court of Justice. And what did they say? Did they say it's a genocide? But they cut, then, so do you know how they just quickly on that? Well, they can't do that at this stage. Right. They, so they, they can't do it. No, no, so why do yeah, you bring no, it up? Because because, why, because that's what you do. Because that's they what said, you've done this whole time. Because they said oh, pieces of ideas. Let me pause. It is very clear to me that there is a hold on the ICJ, there is a hold on the UN, and I'm pretty sure that Zionists have that hold on those organizations. And I believe that is why the UN did not declare it as a genocide earlier today. But let's be very clear, even if you do not agree with the act of war actually being complicit in this genocide or the reason for this genocide, you can at least point to the fact that there have been numerous attempts to get aid into Gaza to feed the Palestinian people and Israel has blocked off entry for the aid to come in. They have had trucks deliver the aid and then start shooting at the people when, when they show up to try to get the food. You cannot deny that. So if you don't believe that Israel is trying to commit genocide via war, you can still point to the fact that Israel was trying to commit genocide via starvation. Now, Hen Mazig, he knows that. I 
Is it all, is that a false? They said it was a plausible case. You make a plausible case. Of justice, you can both win that argument, all okay. right? Both of you can win on the international court. Right. No, they haven't said it's a genocide. Yes, they, they have said it's a genocide. They can't say it's a genocide yet. Just no, to get the facts right. about that. But you can say it's a genocide. The international Court of Justice can't say You can say it's a genocide. They can legally determine something, but I can look at the facts. A British guy in London would tell us it's a genocide in Gaza. I want to get you to address this question, though. Let's get away from the generalization. Let's talk specifically about what happened with these aid workers who were killed on the ground. Yeah. Now, it, it's a point that Mark Stone made. It's a point that I know you, you have referred to it and, and said it's, it's revolting. But is it a reality that foreign aid workers present a much greater international challenge to the Israeli government than the deaths of tens of thousands of Palestinians? Absolutely not. I think that every civilian casualty is terrible. And that's what Israel has been saying for since the beginning of this war. Um, I don't think that anyone in Israel, you know, the difference between Hamas and Israel is that when civilians are killed in Gaza, Israelis are not going in the streets and celebrating it. We're not handing out sweets. In that's a damn lie. There have been a number of Israeli government officials that have made statements on video saying that all of them are Hamas. We actually have a representative in Congress who is Israeli, who actually was a part of the IDF, who said even the babies, he said this to Code Pink, said even the babies are also Hamas. So that is a damn lie. From day one, your officials with their big mouths and their cameras have revealed to the world who Israel really is and what they actually want and their intentions and how they feel about the Palestinian people. For everybody else watching, I'm going to keep it real with you 100%. If they feel that way about the Palestinian people, if you're black, how do you think they feel about you? And don't come to me and say, oh, there's Ethiopians and Israelis and they're there. The same Ethiopian Israeli women that the government sterilized against their will. So they would not reproduce. They were trying to get rid of them too. They didn't want them there either. Ay, ay, ay. No, but they seem a lot more bothered about the international reaction to these aid workers than they do about the, the continual death of Palestinian civilians. I, I don't think so. I think that the, that the reason that it was so... Uh, um, uh, condemned and, and so important for Israel to come out and condemn it is because it was a targeted attack. It wasn't collateral damage. It was a targeted attack and Israel came out before the U.S. even woke up. It was in the night in the, U in the U.S. and Israel came out and said, this is a mistake. We've made a mistake. We're going to improve ourselves. Oh. We're going to try to, to do better in the future when we're fighting a war against an organization that is hiding itself among civilian population, building tunnels and no. shelters okay. underground and then putting the civilians above ground, hoping that Israel would attack Just those civilians. Stop. How do you put the civilians above ground when the civilians already live above ground? Putting the civilians above ground, right? So when we talk about the West Bank, so their excuse, what's your excuse for kicking people out of their homes and building illegal settlements? Hmm? What's Israel's excuse for a bomb in Lebanon and bomb in Syria? Hmm? Who's next? They're going to come after Jordan next? Who's next? Who else are they going to come after and claim it's all Hamas? And then having people in the I'll West, in uh, having people in the West going on to channels and defending them. That's the issue here. And Sorry, there's one, his, there's one country, let me just finish the one. one oh, no, we'll come to you. Uh, just, there's one country that has built shelters, bomb shelters, invested billions of dollars in defense system in protecting its civilians. And there's a terrorist organization that has done everything it can, building a channel of, of uh, tunnels underground in Gaza that is like the London underground to hide, not civilians, to hide hostages, Israeli hostages and Hamas terrorists and ammunition. That's the problem here. And that's, uh, I can't believe that we haven't seen this clearly. I would, I, I want to Tia's point, since he keeps bringing up the tunnels again with the claims that Hamas was underground, yet you guys never went underground and got them. 100%. I'll ask a question actually to both of you. Well, I'd like to, oh, do I get transferred to that? Or? Uh, I, I'd like to move on. Lots of Which is this, Owen? I don't think we can just have misinformation on national television that isn't corrected. What are you saying is misinformation now? Uh, well, I mean, first he accused me of defending Hamas, uh, which I have to say, those smears might have worked once, but it just people okay. watching this think you're desperate. The point about human shields, a brilliant piece of investigative journalism in Plus 972 magazine by the brilliant Israeli journalist Yuval Abraham revealed the use of artificial intelligence, a system called Lavender. And what that does is generate a whole load of low-level operatives, 
generated by artificial intelligence uh, with a collateral damage level per person of those targets of up to 20 civilians. The idea, which, which we have to say, the IDF has said that it uses this for information right. purposes that it has not used. Okay, well, okay, well, well, six separate intelligence sources briefed this brilliant investigative Israeli journalist. Now you can see what's happened there. There's what they do according to this information is they wait for those operatives to go home when they're in bed with their families there and they blow them up and they blow up their kids and they yep. blow up their families. Can you imagine Hamas? was going around blowing up soldiers, Israeli soldiers, in their homes with they their children. They literally did that. Now, this is, this is, well, well, and, and you, think that's, you think that's unacceptable? Okay. I do. The question is, well, is doing that state sanctioned. Said that. The question I've is, said they committed that. severe... Let's, let's have a reasonable... You watch the atrocities and you challenge their and authenticity. I, said, no, no, I want to ask no, you both a question, which I is didn't this. Do that. If Hamas were to release the hostages tomorrow, mm. what happens then? Uh, look at the West Bank. Look at the number of people who are being slaughtered in the West Bank since this. That was an excellent point that he brought up, and I'm glad he brought that up, because that is an important point that you should mention to people if they say, well, if they release the hostages, you know, what happens after that? Yeah, that's a good question for the state of Israel, because Hamas releases the hostages. Is that going to stop Israel from removing Palestinians from their homes in the West Bank? Is that going to make Israel change the laws that they have in the West Bank against the Palestinian people, the apartheid that they have? Are they going to change any of those things? Because here's the thing. As long as you continue to occupy people and let's say they do go in and they completely destroy Hamas. Right. Let's say that happens. Even after all of that. The people who have endured what they have endured during this time since October 7th. We'll always remember that. So basically what Israel is actually doing, they are actually possibly creating another type of Hamas because of what they're doing to the people right now. These groups don't rise up out of nowhere. No one wakes up one day and says, I just think I'm just going to, you know, go out there and start taking taking shit and bust through and just no one that doesn't come out of nowhere. And when you have sat up there and you've occupied people for all these years and you've treated them like animals and you called them animals, you've imprisoned their people, you've imprisoned children. There have been stories that have been reported of people being abused in, in the jail in Israel. There's no formal process. There's no due process for the Palestinians that are captured and taken by the IDF. They're just captured just because they feel like it. There is no court system for them to attend, no trial. So that is a good question. What happens after all of this is said and done? Who is going to come in and make sure that Israel is not continue to take those homes in the West Bank? Who's going to step forward? Because the UN ain't shit. And you can tell them I said it. The UN isn't stepping forward to do anything. The ICJ isn't doing any damn thing. Talking about get back to me 30 days later with a report. This ain't school. Israel is not in class and they don't owe you a report card. So it is very clear what is happening here. It's very obvious. I don't know how much more people are going to put up with this. Again, last year alone, before the 7th of October, 240 Palestinian civilians, 40 of them children, were killed in the West Bank. And we were told that was a ceasefire. In the West Bank now, people are being driven from their homes and they're being slaughtered. The West Bank is not run by Hamas, it's run by Fatah, who put down their arms and accepted a peace process. What we're seeing in Gaza already, this idea of releasing the hostages, which I want. Taking those hostages was a severe war crime, a grave and unacceptable war crime. And the only way hostages have been released in any significant number is through ceasefire and prisoner swaps. That includes those prisoners who have been need to be released. And again, the information that's come out today of the treatment of these prisoners who are held without charge, with their handcuffed so much that they've been amputated, as well as the work by Save the Children, which is 
detailed how child detainees are sexually and physically abused. Oh, and now, it's very important and, 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 that, I, we, that I, we talk about this. I want to give you to get a, a chance. Yeah. Same question. If the, if the hostages were released, what do you think would happen? I mean, the amount of passion that you have for Palestinian prisoners, but not for the Israelis and, and the... No, and, I, just and called, I, I said I it was a war crime. A war. I said a it was a severe war crime. 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 But they did not dis describe in specific what the Israeli hostages are, being, are going through for six months Well, now. I'm asking you, know, and that's, if and they I know, were released, and, and I just want They're going through the same type of starvation that the Israeli government is doing towards the Palestinian people. Because let's be clear, let's not pretend like the like the the Israeli hostages just have some ma magic food somewhere. So when they decided to try to starve the Palestinian people, they were starving their own hostages too. I just want to point it out because it's important because we're uh, we're seeing this uh, campaign by yourself and others that are pushing those um, uh, details that are not even true uh, that are widely contested by uh, every uh, news media and, and, and intelligence uh, agency in, in the world um, and, and and you know if the if if you want to know what would happen if the hostages would be released, go back to October 6th. The, the reason that the hostages are there is because Hamas went into Israel, committed one of the worst massacres against Israeli civilians, and took innocents from their beds, from their beds, babies. There's a baby in Gaza that Owen did not mention here. And that's the issue. I haven't mentioned every war. I said it was a war, so, so okay. war crime. I, the difference between me and you no, is I, I condemn all war point, crimes. That's gentlemen, I'm going to cause a... There's much more I'm, than I'm that. Gonna... Yeah, so they continue to exaggerate right? It's the worst thing that ever happened. Exaggeration, exaggeration. So Owen Jones is kind of going through a political uh, transformation. Now he wasn't like progressive, so to speak, or whatever, right? Like he's not, he didn't describe himself as a socialist or anything like that. Or I think he was more like a, maybe a dim, dim socialist or whatever. Um, but he's not like a Marxist or communist or anything like that. And for years he was a part of the labor party. So something is happening with Owen Jones and he did make this announcement. I think he's had enough. And I think what's happening in Gaza really set him off. He decided to leave the labor party. Listen to this. I've always been a labor guy. My great granddad who had his wages docked in the general strike a century ago was a labor counselor. So is my grandma, her proudest achievement stopping a family being evicted by their private landlords over Christmas. My parents even met at a Labour Party meeting. Romantic. On my 15th birthday, my mum bought me a Labour Party membership as a present. I know. What a loser. My cat's even named after Keir Hardy. He's the first leader of the Labour Party, whose picture proudly hangs on my wall. Well, at least that little guy's done the name proud. Now, I voted Labour under every single leader in the 21 years of my adult life. I spent years working for Labour MPs. I've campaigned for the party hundreds of times. I've done fundraiser after fundraiser for MPs on every wing of the party, organized countless mass canvases across the country. So this is someone who had this like deeply, you know, this was deep in his family. Like, it's not like, you know, like he was born with this. <laughs> he was born with Labour it. Labour Party's been a big part of me. But today I've quit. Felt pretty emotional. But you see, I can't support a Labour leadership defined by dishonesty, whose words you can't trust on anything, which lacks any vision, belief or principle, which is driven only for power for its own sake, and which will over and over again defend the interests of the rich over those whose lives are just getting harder and harder. And I can't support a party with a total lack of answers to the massive crises and injustice that define this country which I fear when their government comes crashing down under the weight of their own dishonesty and failures will just pave the way for the far right. And I just can't support a party run by people who I think will dangerously abuse the huge power that they're gonna get. And there is no way on earth I can support a leadership which refuses to condemn and which even justifies war crimes. The mass slaughter of approaching 40,000 Palestinians, many of them kids, toddlers, babies. You know what? What I really want is to end the war on hope. So, at the next election, what I think we should do is vote for the Green Party or an independent candidate who stands for things like asking the well-off to pay more tax so we can invest in and rebuild our bad country, our services and utilities being run by the public rather than these rip-off profiteers, but candidates who want radical action on everything from the housing crisis to poverty to the climate emergency, and do you know what? Candidates who aren't complicit in war crimes. Now, that might mean, by the way, not just Green or independent candidates, but some of the surviving decent Labour candidates who believe in those things. That's if they're not booted out by then. Some of them already have been and more will be, because if that's 
the sorts of things you believe in, Labour wants you crushed. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> Sounds like the Democratic Party, right? If you believe in those things, then eventually they're going to push you out, just like they did Cynthia McKinney, just like they did uh, Dennis Kucinich. So he announced that he left the Labour Party, like he's not playing around. He's just like, look, I didn't had it. I didn't had it. And he's telling people vote green or vote independent. So even in the UK, you're seeing changes. You saw what happened with George Galloway, right? running through the Workers' Party, you see how he was able to win. And I guess the prime minister in the UK just lost it. Like he couldn't take it, right? So one of the things that's been questioned to Owen Jones recently is, is he concerned that he is now destroying his career? I want you to hear what he had to say about that. For me, on Gaza, yeah. for me, that is such a clarifying moment, which has changed me forever. Because I, can, that's my impression. I, I yeah. cannot believe what I've seen in terms of how the world cannot be screaming at the top of its lungs against this crime and watching people not only fail to do so, but render themselves complicit has changed the way I look at the world. But they crossed the red line over Gaza. They crossed the red line, which in my view is unforgivable. I'll never forgive them. Um, and that's why I think I'm, you know, I'm more committed and unwavering in my politics because I think over Gaza, when you have moral clarity, that make, gives you a toughness because you think to yourself, it doesn't matter how much you get attacked. It doesn't matter how much insults and abuse you get. You know you're right on this. Some things are not black and white. But when you have moral clarity on something, in my view, which is mass murder, then it stops you from thinking to yourself, well, you know, these doubts are, gr are gnawing at me. And I don't have any doubts. And if I destroy my career, then I don't care because um, I know this is the right thing to do. That's the point. Now, that is, it's good that we actually have him on record saying that because like a lot of people do care if they destroy their career. So Owen has like, I don't know, he is having this political transformation, uh, which I think is really good. I think we need to see more of those things. Earl of Laurel says, invite Owen. I will try to reach out. I will try to find contact info for him. I need to invite him <clears throat> and uh, uh, George as well. Uh, if I can, but yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, I do want to go to some of the comments here about this. I saw something. Yes. Sandy, has he ever apologized for smearing Jeremy Corbyn as an anti-Semite? I am not sure. I can look that up for you. I saw that come up through the chat. Um, so I'll check, I'll check on that. I'm pretty sure I would hope that he has, <clears throat> I would hope that he has by now. Uh, thank you, Sparky. Debbie Wiserman Schultz and Victoria Newland went to charm school together. <laughs> uh, Royal says, Sabby rally for reparations July 15th. Marcel gonna be there. I will have to check. For some reason, I thought that was in June. I might have... I had to check my calendar. I might have my dates mixed up. For some reason, I thought that was in June, but I will check the Banco Canto and see if I'm able to make it. Because um, there was another thing someone wanted me to go to in D.C. Everything's always in D.C. You guys know that wanted me to go to in D.C. And I said, I got to check the bank account. Uh, thank you for the super sticker, Don. Thank you, Roger. Dude running around here looking like a knockoff sauger. I think you're talking about uh, Hen. <laughs> uh, thank you, New York Varsity. Sabby, you are on point with the sentiment of black people in America on this matter. Even white people who only have one black friend see this. Thank you. Do all things with love. We must address Debbie Wiseman Schultz properly as pasta has called her Congressman ramen noodle hair. Thanks, Savvy. <laughs> uh, Janine says the UN ain't shit should be a t-shirt. Hmm. <laughs> Thank you, New York Varsity. This is not making the people of Israel safe, but endangering them more. There are mass protests happening in Israel that few are reporting. Silence. This is true. And thank you, Sparky. No man is an island entire if itself. Ask not. For whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. John Dunn. I was thinking Metallica. <laughs> I was thinking Metallica for whom the bell tolls. <laughs> We're going back. We're going back. 90s. I think that was 90s. 90s or late 80s. Thank you for this as well, Sparky. Bet. Hen doesn't actually know a single October 7th victim. He lies about that too. Interesting. I'll take the rumble rant, Eric. Thank you. 
Only for Bell Tolls, the thing I know is, is Metallica. That song is pretty lit. For whom the Bell Tolls. Uh, thank you for the Rumble Rant, Goo81. Good on those students. Also, apparently, Richard Medhurst. What? Is running as MP under George Galloway something. It disappeared. All right. I'll have to check uh, Richard's thing on Twitter. And thank you for the tip on Rockfin JVB for the $5 tip. Thank you so much. Yeah. Sab, you right. It is June 5th. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> I was like, am I confused? I thought I, it said June. Okay. <laughs> Based. All right. Let's get into a little bit more debate style, right? Abby Martin was on Pierce Morgan's show to debate. This woman looks like the Joker when she smiles. Her name is Emily Schrader. I'm not kidding. She has that Joker smile because it comes, you'll see, you'll see. Uh, will you give any condemnation of Hamas? Let's get into it. This one's pretty base, guys. If you haven't had a chance to do so, go ahead and smash the Liz Ike. And if you're new, don't forget to like, sub, and share. I told you, wait till she smiles harder. You're going to see it's like a Joker smile. I do. And I think that the fact that this debate is raging on shows that what Israel is doing is egregious enough. The fact that people are actually having a debate on whether or not it is genocide. Like you said, the International Court of Justice has agreed that there's a plausible case for genocide. I think that you just clearly articulated several factors that Israel is, in fact, carrying out. The mental bodily harm and caring about conditions uh, to destroy a group of people. Clearly, the complete siege on Gaza, the elimination or the prevention, rather, of water, food, electricity, the prevention of aid, um, widespread preventable illnesses, uh, killing people. Now uh, we see two million people on the brink of starvation. Clearly, these are all intended to destroy a group of people. When you compound that with the indiscriminate bombing in the most densely populated places on Earth, I would absolutely constitute that as genocidal killing. And then peers compound that with the fact that there's genocidal intent. This is usually one of the hardest things to prove in a case of genocide. Not the case in Israel's genocide in Gaza. We have five pages just in the ICJ ruling that clearly lay out the explicit intent to carry out genocide. And I'll just point to two. Uh, the Israeli president, who said shortly after October 7th that uh, no civilian in Gaza is innocent um, and that they should have overthrown Hamas. And because they yep. didn't, they are essentially worth, uh, you know, killing. And then you have the defense minister shortly after October 7th that these are human animals and we need to act accordingly as he announced the complete siege of Gaza. So taking all that into account, I would absolutely constitute what is happening is genocide. And Israel needs to be held accountable and stopped immediately because it's the gravest crime against humanity that a state can commit. Okay. Well said uh, there, Abby Martin. Yeah, we got to remember a lot of the things that IDF members and Israeli uh, officials, government officials have said on camera is very damning. All right, let's bring in Harley Quinn. Emily Schrader, I mean, there's no doubt that if you study the direct quotes from some members of Netanyahu's cabinet, they are certainly speaking in a genocidal way. There's no question. There's enough of that being said since October the 7th. There's also yeah. a, a I actually would dispute that. I actually take issue with some of the comments that she made. For example, when we're talking about human animals, it was specific in the context. And if you understand Hebrew, you know uh, that the context of this was... Oh, now we got to know Hebrew. Now we got to understand and know Hebrew to know what they really, what she really meant, what the context was. You guys see this? You see? <laughs> Here we go with the exceptionalism. Speaking specifically about Hamas terrorists, who I would agree with that description. Of course, not all Palestinians are human animals and Palestinian civilians. There are many innocent people. However, as President Herzog said, it is also true that there is a certain degree of complicity with many of the people of Gaza. Now, does that mean that they deserve to die, as she stated? No, of course not. But it's not the same thing as being innocent either. But that would imply that there are no innocent people in the Palestinian side. Exactly. <laughs> Well, of course, they're not all uh, Hamas, but they're not all innocent either. She walked right into that one. 
Harley Quinn walked right, in, right into that one because she's letting you know that she still doesn't really believe that they're all innocent. Oof. I don't think that that's true, that there's no innocent people. Isn't that what I think you just that afraid to be safe? I think that there is a certain degree of complicity with many of the population. How as many? we see in, in the polls, according to their polls, the Palestinian conducted polls. How many? Poll, How many? Over 70% of the people in Gaza support the actions of October 7th. I wish it wasn't the case. But Emily, you're but just that using that. That is the reality that, on You're the just using that poll. You're using that poll to paint all civilians as guilty. Do you I realize am, that? I when am you absolutely do that, you're not. I literally stated the opposite. Yes, you I are. said 70%. You're saying that because I Palestine said 70 percent. Emily, of course, there are innocent Palestinians. So what does that mean? But what Emily is giving me strong Karen vibes. Are you guys getting that feeling from her? Emily's giving me Karen vibes. Like, I feel like any minute she's going to, you know, I don't know. Like, let me see your manager. <laughs> Any minute she's going to show up and be like, what are you doing here? Do you work here? Are you supposed to be in this neighborhood? Let me talk to your manager. That's the vibe that I'm getting from Emily. But notice what is happening here. She's pretty defensive here. That is not what I said. But that is actually what she's saying. She's basically telling you that there are really no innocent people. But you say like there's some, and she said the poll was like 70%. If I tell you that the poll says 70% of the people support what Hamas did, 70% is the majority, obviously. So I'm also telling you that the majority of the people are not innocent. I you're, know. you're rationalizing collective punishment and starvation of 2 million people, 1 million kids. That's what you're rationalizing by saying Abby, that 70%. Abby. Over 17,000 trucks of humanitarian aid have entered Gaza. Some of them that are being stopped right now on the border are actually being prevented from entering by Egypt, not by Israel. Israel has inspected them and approved them. Furthermore, the reason that aid isn't being distributed properly isn't because of Israel. It's because of Hamas, who has been taking the aid, shooting Palestinian civilians inside of Gaza. And this is according to Palestinian statements on social media in Arabic who have been speaking about this. And then taking that aid and selling it at double, triple, quadruple the prices of what would be the regular market for those items. So you cannot place this all on Israel. But if you say that seven. Actually, we can. And, and this woman is is full of lies. But actually, we can. Because remember, it was the Israeli people that were blocking the entrance. They were blocking. They actually took like. I mean, because they have different cones. They took different cones and they also took their vehicles and they actually created a barricade to prevent the trucks from getting in. We saw the videos all on social media. Is that Hamas's fault too? Emily. I, I was like, uh, Abby, 70% so of people uh, in Palestine are of this view. 50% of that population are under 18. They're, they're children. So are you including large numbers of children in your assessment that Palestinians or, or believe this way? I don't believe that the statistics of that poll, how they conducted it, included children. However, I don't know. So I would have to investigate that. If it didn't further. include children, then that doesn't include half the people in Gaza. And that's According to whose statistics? According to the Gaza Ministry well, of Health, which is. Oh, so you see this? I believe the poll that says 70% of Palestinians support what Hamas did on October 7th because it supports the narrative for Israel to go in and demolish and kill all the people. But I don't believe the information that says that half of the population in Gaza were children. What? <laughs> you guys see this? No, 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 half the population. Because even this 30,000 oh, number hang on, is I'm coming not, from Hamas. I'm not, I, I realize that, but it hasn't been disputed by other agencies. And what she's telling you once again is that the information that comes from the Gaza Health Ministry, anything that comes from Hamas, that it should not be believed. But you should believe everything that the Israeli government tells you. You expose yourself, Emily. Historically, the Hamas. Uh, figures through the Palestinian Health Authority have been broadly proven to be accurate over time, which you 30, know. 30,000 casualties and they're claiming that but, none of them are that's combatants. Not the, How is that accurate? That's it doesn't not the, even make sense. That's not the number I'm talking about. The number I'm talking about is if half the population of Gaza is under 18, then saying that 70% of the people in Gaza have a view 
would have to include a lot of children, right? That's and if right. you don't include the children, you don't include half the population, well, then you're talking about a narrow number of people. Comparative. Sure, but you also have to consider the fact that Hamas is actively recruiting and indoctrinating youth with this very extremist jihadist ideology. And it's have they been recruiting and in indoctrinating babies, Emily? The babies that were in the incubators in the hospital, were they recruiting them? Let's let's talk about this for a second. Let's talk about doesn't the IDF recruit people? Hello. Doesn't the IDF recruit people? Doesn't Netanyahu's genocidal government recruit people? Don't they also indoctrine the Israeli children when they are children and teach them just how awful the Palestinian people are? They killed babies. Babies in hospitals. I'm supposed to believe those babies in the incubator are Hamas? child abuse it's an unfortunate reality that palestinian children are dealing with why we're we killing loads why we're we killing 12 13000 innocent children whatever the exact number is is superfluous to the general proportionate effect that so many kids have been killed i don't agree with this these numbers well, how many do you think I, have been killed dispute, we don't know we right. do not know at this and yet point. You're but you're very happy on the Israel side. You have to consider the fact okay, how many, that there how many, are many of okay, them between the question. ages of 14 to 17 how many who Hamas, are members of Hamas. How many and Hamas, we have seen that proof. She doesn't agree with the numbers that don't support the Israeli narrative. That's what it is. How many Hamas terrorists have been killed? So we this don't is, know. Oh at least 9,000, though. So you're happy to, to believe those numbers? How many people believe those you're, numbers? You're happy to believe those numbers. Of course I'm happy to believe Why? those numbers. Because Israel is a de democratic country with the rule of law, and they hold people accountable when they violate those laws. Right, okay. Pause for a second. People say the United States is a democratic country with laws, and we hold people accountable when they violate those laws. But then think about the police state that we have in this country. Think about police brutality. How many times have police officers been held accountable for police brutality incidents in this country? You see, just because you're a democratic country or just because you are a democracy, which I told you before, we don't have true democracy in this country. That doesn't mean that the laws that you have in place are actually working in a way that is fair to everyone and everybody. We see that right here in the United States. So if you see it doesn't work fairly for everyone in the U.S., what would make you think in a country like Israel that is an apartheid state where the Palestinian people are occupied, what would make you think that the laws that are there in this so-called democratic state is working fairly for everyone there? I mean, you see, I, I think the problem with questioning the yeah. numbers from the Palestinian Health Authority is that most other agencies, independent agencies, broadly agree that these numbers are about right. And if they're right, then 12,000, 13,000 children have been killed. And I would, I would argue that it's very hard to see how the radicalization issue that the Israelis talk about will not be exacerbated by killing 13,000 innocent kids. Right. And can I just address some of the points she made? Because they're all just egregious lies. I mean, she's a paid propagandist for the state of Israel. I think uh, that we kind of like you being a paid Egypt, propagandist uh, Emily, for Putin, Emily. Or defending the Chinese Communist Party. You know or what? Defending Emily, the Chinese Emily, Communist Party. Emily, let me speak. Let me speak. Let me speak. See, they don't like it when you start telling the truth about them. They try to interject here. And so all of a sudden it's, oh, you're working for Russia. You see, <laughs> this is already predictable. You're working for Russia. You're a propagandist for China. Emily, Hong Kong. let me Emily, speak. Let, talk. let me speak. Emily, let me speak. You just spoke just flagrant lies for the last minute. When I was on this show 10 years ago, I was actually speaking out against RT on Russia today. Can you say the same? I'm a completely independent journalist. You are literally a paid propagandist for the Israeli military. That you just is had the audacity liable. to sit down with an Israeli military any funds official. From the Israeli military, uh, and I would be happy oh, so to you just were over. working for free? You literally said that you worked for the Ministry of Strategic Affairs, that you've worked with Stand With Us, which is an appendage of the Israeli government. Let me no, address the, the things that you just threw out there, which are lies. Yes, of course, they receive grants from the Knesset. No, they don't. Emily. That is absolutely false. Egypt, Israel has. Br look it up on. 
Look it up on the internet, Emily. I'm not sure why you're lying uh, again, I work but this there, is what you guys sure do. You deflect, you lie, you smear. Emily, from the we can't just keep it's speaking over each other the entire it's not time. Legal. Then stop Emily, lying, Abby. Please let me stop speak. Stop lying. Israel has <laughs> Israel has has bragged the fact that Egypt just follows their orders. Okay, so we know that the aid is being prevented not only by fanatical Israelis who are blocking the aid trucks proudly, um, but from Israel themselves, Emily. And we know that. Almost as many civilians have been shot by Israeli forces just trying to scavenge for aid and food than civilians have died on October 7th. This is regular routine massacres, routine massacres that are happening of just desperate, starving Palestinians that are amassing to seek food. Is there anything that is more depraved? Than that, That's absolutely than to false. Shoot Earlier desperate this week, seven people million, seeking seven food. Million you can't, you food, can't just keep saying Hamas. Gaza. So let me show you something, guys. Remember in the debate with Owen uh, Jones and with uh, Hen Mazig? Notice that Hen also pointed out, well, you can't say that Israel is purposely starving the Palestinian people because the truck went in earlier this week. Notice how she's using the same talking point that Hen used. These debates weren't that far apart from each other in reference to days. I told you they all say the same things. You can watch a debate with Pierce Morgan on Pierce Morgan show. And then you can watch a debate on someone else's show, PBD podcast or whatever, different people, but still Zionists. And they're saying the same talking points. I know because you, you peek around and you see all these different shows within one week and you'll hear them saying the same type of rhetoric. So what they're trying to do now is because the truck got in earlier this week, they're trying to use that as an example to prove that this was never an issue in reference to getting food into the Palestinian people, that those things never happened. So that's what they're pointing to. These people are paid liars. Abby is 100% correct. We have all seen the videos on social media of them barricading the roads so that the trucks can't get through. I saw videos on social media of the IDX, IDF, excuse me, actually setting trucks on fire so that the Palestinian people couldn't get the aid. And she can just sit here and just blatantly lie because, again, this is what this woman is paid to do. I think these people are coached. I think that they are trained. And I think that they are paid. Seven million pounds you, in no, one day. Let me try, let me try if I can. Let me try and bring should it, be getting in. I want to come back trucks to, per day. Let me, come in, come in, if I can, bring it back to the debate, which is about the genocide. Uh, on March the 26th, 2024, UN Human Rights Report called for Israel to be placed under an arms embargo on the grounds it has carried out acts of genocide in Gaza. Uh, Francesca Albanese, the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in the Palestinian Territory, said in her report, there were reasonable grounds to believe that Israel was carrying out three of the five acts, which I named earlier, defined as genocide. And she said these were killing Palestinians, causing them seriously bodily or mental harm, deliberately inflicting conditions of life calculated to bring about the physical destruction of the population in whole or in part. So to that point, Emily, just forget the ad hominem stuff for a moment. On this, you've got the UN, you've got the ICJ, you've got uh, increasingly the Americans actually trying to distance themselves from what's happening here. A, a growing sense that there is, if not full-blown genocide, a version of genocide happening here that meets quite a few criteria. I mean, I think the definition of genocide requires intent to destroy a nation. Um, and that is not what we're seeing. It's not what we've seen since day one. You have to remember the fact that this war was not there started was a cabinet by Israel. Minister who Gaza's actually destroyed said he would be Emily. happy to drop a nuclear bomb on Gaza. That would have been the destruction of well, the population. Well, there are plenty of... Even, even Kamala Harris said that Gaza has to be rebuilt because it looked so damn bad stupid comments from many Israeli politicians that I don't agree well, with. You said earlier that nobody on But this that, is not the same you said thing. Earlier, we did not start on, this Emily, war. This is not a war we wanted. Emily, it I is understand. not a war we started. I've made that point very clear. Let me Israel finish. does have the ability to commit genocide, and they are not. Let Why just, would we send 17,000 trucks That's such aid? an me, abusing not crazy thing to say. You have a gun to the head of Palestinians saying, we could commit genocide. Hang on, don't all talk over each other. I want to finish my point about the cabinet member who said that was quite crystal clear in his genocidal intent. He thought it would be fine to drop a bomb, a nuclear bomb, on Gaza. You said earlier that nobody on the cabinet, nobody under Netanyahu from the start of his war, had ever espoused any genocidal 
thoughts or statements. He did that. Well, I didn't say that no one in, in the government has said that. I said that the quotes she specifically mentioned are inaccurate. Right, but what about the guy who got fired specifically for saying that about dropping a nuclear fired. bomb? Right. He so, should have been fired. So do you accept there have been people with that mindset on the cabinet? I in, think that there, there are people who have made all kinds of egregious statements on both sides. And I can give you a few examples of genocidal yeah, but, intent if you want from the other side. Well, how, that's really the only side. But, you, but, you, that but that's not that's not the question that you're being asked, uh, Emily. Notice how she's trying to pivot. Has proven we can, we can come to that. We can come to that. But on that point, do you accept then that there are people in Israeli government, albeit he was fired for it, who have espoused genocidal sentiment? They have. I don't know of anyone who is in the current Israeli government well, that no, would support fired. any form of genocide. Right. Has anyone Look ever? Of course, ruling. people have on both Five sides. Pages. Okay, Abby. Uh, let's fast forward to do, 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 this part here. If she condemns Hamas, let's let's go to this part because this part I think is. But do you condemn Hamas? Okay. Doesn't govern the West Bank. Look at what Israel has done in the West Bank since October. You can't condemn 7. Hamas for what this they isn't did about on October Hamas. the seventh. This is not about Hamas. Well, it's all I about Hamas. I condemn what will be get violence about Hamas. inevitably. What are you talking about? I'm not going to sit here and condemn Hamas. The entire war. I'm sorry? The, it's in, this entire war has been because of what Hamas did on October the 7th. You can go back Absolutely in history. Absolutely not. You can go Absolutely back in not. history Here's. and you Here's. can find arguments on both sides in the last 70 years. Right? I've had, no, I've had the arguments not. many There's, times. No, no, no. But you no, cannot no, see, dispute what you're doing, this. What you're doing is... What am I doing? What you're doing is conflating and pretending like there are two equal sides. Oh, they've just been fighting for decades. There's always reasons on both sides to start the violence. No, that's not true. There's one side that's an occupying colonizing force that continuously and violently expels and subjugates and brutalizes and terrorizes the other side. They are living under the boot of Israeli authorities, whether you're in Gaza and occupied completely militarily by the outside or whether you're living under a fascist military dictatorship in the West Bank. So do you, do, if that you believe- Pierce Morgan is basically trying to make it seem like the Palestinian people and the Israeli people are on the same level and they're not. There is literally one group of people that is in power and the other one is not. The other one is being oppressed. The other one is being occupied. Let me make something very clear to you. I sit up here and I watch a lot of these discussions on this show about this particular issue. And I honestly think some of these people, I look at Pierce Morgan and I look at, um, uh, Karen, uh, Emily there. And I really do believe had we, if we were to go back in time, these would be the same people that would have made excuses and justified slavery in this country. These would have been the same people that would have made excuses. And then when you have Nat Turner slave rebellion, when you have those revolts try to rise up, when you have the Underground Railroad, these are the people that would try to find a way to blame the slaves from trying to free their oppressor instead of putting the blame on the slave master. I really believe that. I don't think they would have been on the right side of history because they're not even on the right side of history right now when there's video, smartphones, and social media to show you. Okay, root so if of you the believe, violence. Okay, so that let me is ask the root you, of the violence. This is this. 75 years let me of ask you this, Abby. Right, I hear you. Let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. If you believe then that Hamas are a uh, armed resistance, as you put it, and they have, presumably then you believe what they did on October the 7th was justified, do you? I didn't say that. No, no, no. absolutely well, not. Wouldn't that be I'm the not sitting here justifying anything. Isn't the I'm logical just, just extension of your that. argument? If you believe they're an armed resistance and they are, That's not true. They are doing what they're doing because they are responding to acts of terror by another side, surely you would say that what they did was justified. Or if it's not justified, what is it? You either condemn it or you think it's justified. I don't think you can sit in the middle, can you? Um, I Look, I don't need to sit here and give a condemnation of Hamas. I, I, I can explain why Hamas exists. Mm. I don't have to support what they did, I don't have to justify or rationalize it. Yes, so you know, violence sit, in the face uh, of as rape a, as, as a, a method person who of studies war history, is complicit. You can sit Abby. as a person who studies history. Mm. Emily, Emily, you're doing the exact same thing and you're projecting it on me. Okay, so do you condemn the actions of Israel for killing 13,000 children? I don't accept that 13,000 children have been killed. See what they do? Everybody paying attention to what they actually do? Now, Abby flipped it on her, which I think was very smart because it's usually the other way around. People are asking, do you condemn Hamas? But 
Abby flipped it and said, well, do you condemn what the Israeli government has done in reference to killing all of these children, right? So what do they do? I told you, I think they're coached and trained. So their response is, I don't believe those are the numbers. It doesn't matter what the numbers are. I want to be clear about this, folks. It doesn't matter if it's 13,000, 8,000, 5,000. It does not matter what the numbers are. We're talking about children. And this is what people should continue to reiterate when they get that type of pushback. When people tell you, well, I don't think those numbers are true. It doesn't matter. These are kids. And it's probably more than 13,000. Remember, the people who are under the rubble have not been counted. Notice they cut off that cap, the total number of 30,000, right? Notice they don't go higher than that anymore, right? That's on purpose. So that is their talking point. That's one of the ways that they come in and try to divert the conversation. So they're trying to pull you away from what Abby is actually asking. So she can just easily say, I don't think those numbers are real. It doesn't matter, these are kids. Kids that I've seen, I've seen these kids on video. I'm sure some of you have too. She's answering the question without answering the question. Folks, she really does not give a damn. When she tells you that she doesn't buy those numbers, I'm trying to tell you that the life of a child, children are innocent, period. She's telling you she doesn't buy the numbers. It doesn't matter what the numbers are. Children are innocent. They are killing kids. She does not have a problem with that. And instead of saying that, because then she'll be busted, she has to try to tell you that she doesn't believe the numbers. That's the pivot. That hasn't okay, any, see, that this isn't is, this anything is that's problem. been verified. This is the problem. But it a depends on the context Israeli of what's happening. Do I condemn certain up there actions of and the state of Israel? Denying Palestinians Absolutely. their reality. Do I think Israel is always right? You're denying Palestinians not. their reality. This is why Palestinians Israel have to shoot their dead kids each other, on camera. Please. Do I think everything Israel has done, even in this war, is correct? No. There's no problem with saying that. What has been wrong? What have they done? I, I already said the same on, thing about Abby. Hamas. Hang on, Abby. I already said Hang the on, same thing about Hamas. Emily, tell me what Israel's done that's, that's wrong in your eyes. I think that that should have been a priority from the beginning uh, in order to plan a safe evacuation route before they implemented a military plan. I think that everything has been done too late. Okay. The evacuation route, you mean the evacuation routes that Israel blocked? There were Palestinians that were on video saying they were going to those exit locations and Israel was bombing the exits where they told them to go to evacuate. You're talking about those routes, Emily? Notice Emily didn't say anything about the killing of the children, okay? Because she don't give a shit. Typical Karen. Abby, what would you say Hamas have done wrong? Uh, I look I, again. I'm not going to sit up here. I don't even know really what happened. You can't find our... anything to condemn rape. You can't find look, anything, look, everything anything to say that all did of the wrong. lies that have been perpetrated. Look, Hamas killing civilians. Uh, I'm sure atrocities were committed on both sides um, on October 7th. I, I'm on sure October 7th. Many atrocities were, were killed. Committed. I don't know. What, what atrocities I don't know did how Israel many civilians were killed by Israel. Emily. Emily, I can't even hear myself talk because you just can't stop right, talking. Let, let Abby speak. Um, there's so many lies that were put out by Israeli authorities that it's really hard to parse through. Look, I mean, we don't know how many civilians were killed in the crossfire by Israeli soldiers um, enlisting the Han Hannibal Directive. So, uh, look, the, the mass rape, what the beheaded the babies, the, the ripping the babies out of pregnant women's stomachs. I mean, all of these things are such egregious lies okay. that I yep. really what just can't the, sit okay. up here what and condemn. And I don't know if Pierce Morgan has done this, but he should probably invite the gray zone on to discuss this as well, because the thing is the gray zone, they were the first ones to debunk that story from the New York times. And then the intercept also debunked it even further. So that story has been debunked multiple times, but yet all of these Zionist propagandists continuing to go into show after show, spreading the same lie over and over again. 
There is this saying that we used to tell the students in college, repeat, repeat, repeat. So if you continue to repeat something, it'll eventually start to sink in and people will start to believe it. So they know that the story has been debunked, that the New York Times article has been debunked, ladies and gentlemen, but they are continuing to repeat the lie so that it sinks into the brains of the American people so that you will believe it. If I tell you, if I sit up here and tell you that the Boston Celtics are going to win this whole damn thing. And let's say we're in second place. We're actually doing pretty good right now, but let's say we're in second place, but I tell you, we're going to come up from behind. We're going to win. We're going to win. And I keep repeating that and drill it in your head. It won't be long before now that you'll start to believe it's a possibility. That's how repetition works. That is why they're repeating the lies. Things that I don't even know what happened. What about the atrocities which Hamas recorded and filmed themselves and then posted to the world to brazenly boast about what they were doing? What about that? Look, nothing that Hamas did on October 7th compares to what Israel has done in no, response. No, no, I'm asking you a direct question about the fact that they boasted I, you, about you, the mass the murder is, they were committing. you guys just make it all about October 7th. And that's what I'm saying. It, it all pales in comparison. Pierce, but if you can't condemn anything Hamas has done. Happened, I already said. You haven't condemned them. I already said them. killing civilians is wrong. So what killing they did, civilians is wrong. So what Hamas did in October 7th so was wrong. what does that make what hang, Israel hang has done? Notice they don't mention what the IDF did on October 7th, even though Netanyahu's advisor has actually come forward about this on CNN before that they, they got the number wrong. Remember they said 1400 and then they had to scale that number back to 1200 because some of those people, the IDF actually killed their self. Remember that? Now I wish with Abby, with the October 7th stuff, I wish Abby would have talked to like maybe, um, gray zone or, be Katie. Maybe she did. I don't know. I wish she would have talked to them about the October 7th stuff before she did this debate, because once she said, well, I don't really know what happened on October 7th, then that was where like Pierce and Emily can go in for the kill because they're like, oh, well, she don't even really know. So, you know, what is she saying? Right. But the point that I think she leads it back to is that this is not just about October 7th. This has been a, this has been an issue. We're talking about expelling the people right from the land. This has been an issue going all the way back to 1947. Hang on. I'm trying to unpick your argument. So if it's wrong to kill civilians, were Hamas wrong to do what they did on October the 7th, given how many civilians were brutally murdered? Are you doing the same thing to Emily? And if I'm not, just asking, why? do you think it was wrong? Why are you not sitting her? Do you and think it was apart, wrong? Is it wrong to kill thirteen thousand? Why children? can't you answer a is simple question? Is it wrong question? to kill one hundred? I already said it. I already said it. Was Pierce. it wrong? I'm not going to sit here. You're 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 basically comparing Hamas to Israel. No, I'm not comparing anything. You really said just now. Yes, unless you I'm, are. Unless I'm mistaken, you just said to me that the killing of innocent civilians is wrong. I then asked you fairly self-evidently, I think, the question, that in that case, given that Hamas showed us on tape them killing civilians, innocent civilians, on October the 7th, do you accept that was wrong? Yes or no? You saw, you saw the tape? Yes, yeah, they, they showed us. You saw the tape of them killing innocent civilians? Yes, they literally broadcast it to the world, yes. We um, I never saw this video. And I've watched, look, I'm all on, when it came, this all started, I was all on social media. I've never seen this video. What video was he referring to? Builded. And so do Israeli soldiers. Fine, in a why can't you fashion. forget it's, Israel it's like watching, for a moment? It's like watching. Are forget you, Israel for a moment. It's like watching Nazis. If it's wrong to kill innocent civilians, Abby. On social did, media. If it's wrong to kill innocent civilians, I'll ask you one more time. You haven't got to answer, up to you but viewers are watching this and they know you haven't answered. You think it's wrong to kill innocent civilians? I already civilians. answered. I, 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 think, I think it's wrong to kill innocent civilians. So what Hamas did was wrong? She's not going to answer. Well, I'll let her answer if she wants to. <laughs> Last time, I'm going to ask it. So. I don't. I, I already, look, I already told you I'm not going to sit here and condemn what Hamas did. Right. I understand why, I don't have to agree with what Hamas did, right? 
to understand that wasn't why my question. I just happen, asked you whether the mass murder perpetrated on October the 7th was wrong. To understand why there's blowback for horrific policies of apartheid and ethnic cleansing. There's obviously inevitably so going October to be blowback October the 7th was blowback. Policies. Yes, absolutely it was right. blowback. But was it wrong? 100%. Was it wrong? <laughs> I'm not, look, I, I don't know how, how much you want to just go around the mulberry bush like this. Like it's a fairly um, straightforward can, question. Just, I don't see how anyone can come on a show like Israel this. Is doing how can you take can part you in a debate Emily like this and say killing innocent civilians kill is wrong, but I'm not going to tell you what Hamas did on October 7th was wrong. It makes So, Pierce, do you have a problem with Israel killing innocent civilians prior to October 7th? no sense, Abby. No sense. I'm not going to sit here and condemn Hamas. I'm okay. not going to do the obligatory your, right. ritual, I hear you. ritual that everyone is browbeaten into doing. I'm just not going to do it, Pierce. I, I mean, I, honestly, what Israel I think, is doing right now is I think your genocide. denial. I think your denial that what they did was a heinous act of terrorism is actually in its way as bad. I said, I I'm said about to finish my sentence. I said atrocities were committed. Yeah. And I think they atrocities wrong. are wrong and killing innocent civilians are rough. So Look, Hamas were wrong again, to do it. You're browbeating me into trying no, to I'm say I'm just Hamas asking for a straightforward wrong. answer. This was a horrific terrorist attack. I, I, think, I already I, answered you. I think your Pierce. failure to say that Hamas did something wrong is terrible. I think Emily's failure to accept that 12, 13,000 children have been killed is he also terrible. Right? I think that the denial going on on both sides here, which I hear, is frankly appalling. It's First of all, I'm not denying. I'm saying that we don't have the evidence yet of what the numbers are. And we well, don't how know many what the do you think it is, is then? Oh, Pierce, stop, because at the end of the day, you on Emily's side. Don't get it twisted. At the end of the day, you are on Emily's side. Remember, this is, you know, Pierce Morgan, it's Pierce Morgan Uncensored, but we know at the end of the day, you got to ask everybody that come onto that show, but do you condemn Hamas? Israel created Hamas. Never forget that. Abby Martin, I don't know how you withstood that. <laughs> I don't know how you withstood that, Abby. I don't know. I don't know. Um, but kudos to you. Kudos to you. All right, let's go to the comments here. We will do call in tonight, guys. We're going to do it on Zoom. That Zoom link is already pinned to the top of the chat. Some of you guys did this with me uh, last week, so you already know, you know, how this is. Um, oh, actually, uh, Eric is going to do those. Sorry. Yes, Eric is going to do those because I do have to. I really got to pee. I'm sorry. Sorry, you guys. It's too much information. But I really do. Uh, let me you just gotta go. You gotta go. <laughs> no, let me just show this really quick before I forget because I don't want to forget, and I'm trying to get into the habit of doing this. Um, Eric told me I should do a better job at shouting out my patron on the show <laughs> and my website. So this is my patron. If you want to become a Patreon, you can. Here it is. Here, the link is pinned in the description of all my videos, and I have different types of memberships. $1, $5, and you get different items with each one. Those of you who are patrons already know this, but, um, whoops, $10 for Sabsters, $15 for Sabinators, and it tells you what items that you get with it, and $20 for Ultimate Sabbies, and of course, um, I need to dye my hair back that color again. I think that's, yeah, Ultimate was the last one, right? Yeah, Ultimate was the last one there. So that is my Patreon. The link is in the description. And then also my website, which is new. Uh, for whatever reason, the video plan right here doesn't show on Type VNC, but it does on the regular website. So there's actually a video here of me talking that you can't see on Type VNC. You can also find information about me on my website, uh, there is the about section. Of course, I'm not going to go through all this. You can do this on your own. You'll see the links there for merchandise, Substack, and Patreon as well. If you want to sign up for those things, there's also the women Institute freedom of press award. So you'll see award there. There's also information about community organizing that I do, et cetera. 
as well as on the ground coverage, which I'm looking forward to getting back to now that the weather's starting to get just a tad bit warmer here. And of course, you'll see clips of mine that just repopulate here on the website. Uh, it's supposed to go in order, so it should be more the recent ones. I believe that's how that's happening. Yeah, that's how they set that up. So anywho, yeah, I just wanted to make sure I shouted that out because Eric said I need to do... <laughs> Eric said I should probably tell people about those things. Um, I am going to take I a never quick said break. you need to do back. a better job. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take I made a quick. A <laughs> I'm going to take a quick bake. Uh, bake. <laughs> I'm going to take a quick break. I'll be right back, and then we'll start a uh, call in on Zoom. Call in on Zoom. All right. Yeah, you know, you can take a break, or you can take a bake, or whatever needs to happen. All right, so this is the part of the show where we give our Sabrina a little break um, while she needs to do what she needs to do. And um, yeah, I see a compliment from a great website. Yep. Um, Sabrina had, um, what's it on? Uh, she, she's hooked up with a, a, a outfit called Ritual Networks that... Um, uh, that helped her with the website and with other things. She's talked about that at times. All right. Anyways, yeah, with, with um, Abby Martin, I mean, one of the things that I would have liked to have seen her um, kind of really hit at the end there would have been along the lines of uh, of just keep keep talking about the power differential. I mean, to me, that's that's so crucial with with Israel Palestine. I mean, who has all all the power? And it's clear, you know, Israel and their backers, the U.S. and in the you know the the imperial blob, as as we were, have, are the ones who really have all the power, and we should always come back to that. Um, but I, I thought she did overall a great job, you know, especially was you know especially in the end there, it was like two against one. Let's see what we got for some comments here that I can hit while we're on our little break. Um, thanks. Uh, uh, thanks for this super chat, uh, YouTube user. Uh, thank you for having Kim Iverson on your show. You both are great at gathering and packaging information to keep us up to date. Um, thanks for that super chat, YouTuber. Um, and looks like this was from uh, from the Rockfin. Uh, somebody tip Sabby and ask her to upload her show clips to Rumble, please. And I think she will. Uh, she will consider that. Um, that's one thing. Is uh, this stuff is uh, can be a, a lot of work, but I'm sure she'll take that under advisement. Um, thanks uh, for the super chat, Sparky. Correction: the entire uh, island. Correction: island entire of itself. And thanks for this super chat, Roger Meadows, asking for uh, to have his New York ballot initiatives read out. Um, I don't think that's happening tonight, Roger, but I'm sure she'll get to you soon. Um, thanks for this one from Sparky. I'd forgotten uh, John Dunn wrote for Metallica. <laughs> okay, that was a pretty funny one, Sparky. Um, and thanks for this one. Uh, none of your business. Uh, Karen is the most evil person I've seen. Yeah, talking about the person on, um, uh, that Abby Martin was debating on the on the on that Pierce show. And yeah, I mean, Corey and I were 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 talking about it too, and noticing just just it's like what's so funny, you know, woman? What's you know, with all the smirking, and it's really a, a kind of a tell to her personality, I think. Uh, thanks for this uh, uh, super sticker from Muhammad Hassan. Appreciate that. And thanks for the super chat from Sparky. Make Israel Syria again. In those Ottoman Empire days, Levant Jews got along fine with their neighbors, whether Muslim, Christian, or otherwise. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I hear you. I mean, kind of the spin I would put on that is that um, people... It, people will, will in, a, in the natural environment, you know, just naturally will will tend to get along and cooperate and, and be collaborative. I, I, I do, you know, I guess I'm just kind of an optimistic type of person. I do think that is the, the, the natural state of, of humanity and, and human beings. But when it becomes competitive, when when you get thoughts of scarcity in there and, and competition for, for resources is when the ugly stuff starts coming out what i see happening you know with with israel and in gaza is you know it's a genocidal land grab is, is what's happening there it's been you know and they've been at it for 75 plus years and you know i always talk about mcds right money corruption demand solutions you know in this case you know the mc part of this is you know israel land is a resource you know israel and the Zionists are just grabbing all the resources. And it's, you know, it's been a 75 year project. And I think it's important to always bring it back to that, that that's what's going on there. 
it's you know it's just basic you know thievery and um and that's really at, at the base of it and and what we're, we're seeing with you know all these dead children and people and civilians and and everything that's happened is is an extent you know it's just a logical conclusion and extension of that is when you dig down to the root what's going on um thanks very much for this uh super chat uh vegan Zo zorabian um have chris hedges on ha have chris hedges and watch him wipe them off the floor hedges words are piercing no pun intended yeah chris hedges is, is definitely a really um a really um a really great voice you know and all these things and, and has been for for decades and just one of those people who just you know who, who just gets it and is not afraid to, to say it you know of course big big respect from all of us for hedges and and chris has been on the show and um, we'll probably be on again soon and thanks for the super chat, NY Varsity Sports. Abby, like Matt, was not obligated to answer that question. She covers the news, not opines on it. Um, oh, Abby, like Matt, was not obligated to answer that question. She covers the news, not opines on it. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I think that's back to this whole Pierce Morgan, you know, nonsense of this whole, you know, it's frankly childish, this whole, you know, do you condemn Hamas? And, and you know, I, I feel like some of these people who are in Abby's place sh should just start saying to these, um, to these hosts and, you know, asking these ridiculous questions, like, just say back to them, like, are you a child? I mean, is this, is this like, you know, do you, do you condemn Hamas? You know, and your, your answer to that is, is the be all, end all to everything. Um, but let's see. Oh, yeah, I, I wanted to, to um, you know, th there was, you know, the stuff earlier in the show about, about this Coleman Hughes character. And, um, you know, I, I always, like to to connect things you know back to the money and back to the corruption and i, I think if you look at, at what coleman hughes is doing you know it's really he, he's chasing that bag he's it's all about um just being a black face to say to say the things that most black people wouldn't say yep. and he's doing it for the bag you know yeah anyways and he's, he's yeah. propped up by certain people like barry weiss <laughs> okay we are going right. to do uh call in on zoom in so let me go ahead and open that bad boy i'll do it on here because i think um i did it like that last time right i'm gonna start it on let me go ahead and open it just to make sure people can get in and you should be able to see the it's pinned at the um the top of the live chat for the zoom so i'm opening the meeting now and, um, oh, I see uh, a couple, someone already joined. Oh, let me mute myself on Zoom. So I'm just muting myself and we'll do the call in there. And I think I have that link there. Yeah, the link should be there. Pinned to the top of the chat. And then, um, okay, yeah, I guess it's not, I don't know if you it's asking you guys for a call uh, code or not, but I put the code in the chat as well. And there's also a chat option on Zoom, you guys, where you guys can chat with each other in the chat. I'm actually going to put something there and say, uh, sup, <laughs> just to see that. And I think everyone should be muted when they first enter Zoom. And then um, if the way we did this last time, if you want to speak, you just raise your hand. So there's an emoji and I already see some people have their hand. I think Ashira already has her hand raised or his hand raised. Um, okay, someone. Uh, can everyone. Oh, hold on. Can everyone mute for just a second until I get off YouTube? Yeah. Go ahead and mute yourself. Okay. That might have to be coming from your setup. That, that, that might also be from, well, from I can being tell on if here. Someone, I can tell if they're muted on the screen. Right. Yeah, that's why I was saying everybody mute. Okay. Um, Ashura, can you mute for just a second? Thank you. All right, base. All right, guys. Over on uh, Zoom, Savvy After Dark, let's talk. Let's have some chats. Let's do the damn thing. Uh, Chris Hedges will be here Sunday. Don't miss that. That should be an interesting conversation. I'm out of here, folks. Have a good night. Keep up the fight.